a very good morning to all of you the eminent speakers fellow colleagues of different educational and research institutes and obviously my department my institute researchers medical personals and many and my beloved students covid 19 has changed our life completely we have introduced the new terms in our life and those are the terms called lockdown social distancing mask quarantine disinfectant sanitizer ppe etc the travel restriction and border closure together with isolation and quarantine policies implemented in response to covid 19 have made the normal daily life difficult we introduced a new term called the new normal which is a situation we are presently going through so we are toggled to new normal from the normal but the question is whether this new normal is welcome or not and the obvious answer is no according to the latest report who report the world health organization reports this number is very much staggering 1 crore 13 lakhs 27790 cases of covid 19 are active around the world whereas in india the number of active cases right now is 2 lakhs 53287 so we are in the verge of a difficult pandemic situation so why this pandemic situation raises due to which microorganism the microorganism is the virus called the sars cov 2 which is a beta corona virus which is a novel corona virus and there is many more questions about this sars cov 2 the causal organism of the covid 19 disease many people still they think that it is man made virus whereas others think about that they are quite confident that it is a natural virus so there is a controversy for this viral origin though this particular paper of christian g anderson it almost proves that the proximal origin about the proximal natural proximal origin of sars cov 2 and i think all of you now know that it is from the bat to the human but in the middle there is a reservoir host which is pando pangolin and these pangolin so there are lots of questions regarding this corona virus with the comorbidities the diabetes hypertension the morbidities among the covid 19 fatalities covid 19 may trigger new diabetes experts are saying that there are so many lots of controversies regarding all these things many papers are there newspaper reportings are there pregnant women not more susceptible to covid 19 current data suggests many people are saying that many pregnant women during covid 19 pandemic worries about becoming infected with this virus and potentially putting her pregnancy at risk some people are that the black women or the bem are much more susceptible for this viral comorbidity now the bcg vaccine part the vaccine part many people's gavi also said that bcg vaccine can work a modified bcg vaccine can work against this covid 19 and there are lots of talks about the drug repurposing sometimes we are hearing about the chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine sometimes sometimes people are saying that it is not working so we are perplexed 
we are really perplexed. We are now and then we are hearing about the remdesivir. It can work. Some people are saying it cannot work. Pabipiravir, antiviral drug, it can work or not. We don't know. Now we are saying that lopinavir or ritonavir cannot work. So we are really in a perplex perplex state. We don't know what is the reality about these vaccines. Another vaccine is coming. We are hearing about this vaccine that is of Bharat Biotech and that is Covaxin. So these questions, these uncertainties, we also heard about the convulsant plasma therapy, but we don't know what is the exact scenario, whether it is properly working or not. So these questions will be addressed by a panel of eminent guests and scientists. So today, we will hear from the scientists, the real peoples, and we'll understand all these things. So now, I will request Principal Sir to go for his welcome address. Principal Sir, Principal Sir, you were requested for your welcome address, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mondal. Uh, dear friends, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, clearly, sir. Okay. We are happy to host an international webinar on SARS CoV 2 in search of origin to antidote at Domna Motijil College on 7th and 8th July 22. In this meeting, our Honorable Vice Chancellor said, Professor Bashok Choudhury has joined despite his busy schedule. We welcome you, sir. Professor Dhubajyoti Chattopadhyay, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Sister Nivedita University, will give a talk in this webinar. We also welcome Professor Chattopadhyay. Researchers, teachers, and student participate from different parts of the world to discuss about the most trending topics about SARS-CoV-2. Eminent frontliners about this matter would enrich us from the origin to antidote. Let me mention the names. Professor Moitri Bhattacharya, Director, Jagadish Bosch National Talent Search, India. Professor Boshanjit Mukherjee, Professor Cleveland State University, USA. Professor Shuhankar Choudhury, Professor and Head, Department of Endocrinology, IPG, ME, and Art, India. Professor Prashun Bhattacharya, Professor KTH, Royal Institute of Technology, Sweden. Professor Shudip Chakraborty, Professor, University della Calabria, Italy. Professor Govardhan Dash, Professor, Jawaharlal Nehru University, India. Professor Milena Frankel. Mirgenstern, Data Science Institute, Israel, Professor James J. Collin, Professor Massachusetts Institute of Technology, USA, Professor Basho Mukherjee, Calcutta Medical Research Institute, India. I, on behalf of the college, welcome you all. It would be have been better if we welcome you physically rather virtually. But now the situation is different, and we are assembling here to discuss SARS-CoV-2. So the physical distancing has to be maintained. Stay safe. Thank you all. Now I would request our Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, to officially inaugurate the session and say something for us. Over to VC, sir.
principal sir vc sir is there uh, actually we please call him you will come on that meet call please okay. ask please, please call him okay just vc sir is joining very shortly okay what we will do next then our first speaker of the first session yeah. scientific session will present yeah. his talk yeah, please, professor please. dr borshanjit borshanjit mojumdar okay yeah vc okay. sir is saying that he is entering within one minute just a minute so better uh, we have to wait for vc uh, sir just um, uh, for 2 to 3 minutes okay okay uh, professor you just introduce professor borshanjit mojumdar and then vc sir will talk and after that borshanjit will okay 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 okay, okay. so the first speaker the first honorable speaker of the scientific session is professor borsunjit mojumdar he is a professor of molecular genetics in the center of gene regulation in health and diseases department of biological science cleveland state university of ohio usa he completed his bsc in chemistry and msc in organic chemistry from vishwabharati university then he did his mphil and he obtained his phd degree in biochemistry from bose institute kolkata he started his professional career as a scientific officer in geochemistry in the geological survey of india he resigned not only from his so called secure job but also from the certainty and move toward the uncertainty he joined in pharmacology department of university of mineosta as a post doctoral research fellow and then moved to the cleveland clinic foundation research institute in molecular biology in 2004 he joined in the post of assistant professor 
in Cleveland State University and became the professor in August 2013. He has many feathers in his crown, many, many honors and awards. Among the many honors and awards, fewer Elsa Albrecht Fellow Award, F. Marlene Bumpers Jr. Investigator Award, Scientist Development Grant Award from American Heart Association. He received R01 Grant Award from NIH thrice in 2005, 10, and in 2016. His current research interest are molecular mechanism of inflammation and resolution of inflammation. Transitional, translational control in host virus relationship using pathogenic RNA virus as model. Mechanism of ribosome biogenesis. Role of ribosomal protein in embryonic development. His laboratory is always flooded with extramural research grants from different funding agencies. He has been awarded to almost $5 million research fundings till dead for his research work. He is the reviewer of many renowned scientific journals like Cell, Molecular Cell, Cellular Microbiology, RNA, Fabes Letter, Pulse One, and many more. 41 original research articles have been published in peer-reviewed journals of international repute. His passion towards science, his dedication and achievements are extraordinary. It is really very hard to describe the activity of such a person. So I can only bow down to him and can before the enlightened by his scientific discussion. Over to you, sir. Professor Boshanjit Mojumdar, sir, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Should I, should I start? Yeah, I think you can start. Sir, uh, VC sir is there or not? He joined uh, or not? No. I, I don't think so. No, maybe no uh, phone call from him. You, uh, you just ask him and you again, please ask him. And sir, then, what you, sir? only just a minute. I am calling the VC, sir. If he is uh, there, sure, sure, sure. Go ahead, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, yeah, go yeah. Ahead. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Everybody are requested to close their video, please. Uh, Professor Mojumdar, yes. may I ask some personal questions? Sure. Uh, uh, in which year you have passed the uh, masters in Vishwarati? 
1983. I was also a student in physics in 1980 uh, to 85. Oh, really? Yeah. Who was the chair, chairman of the physics, Rana, Rana Vidya? No, no, that uh, that time uh, Dipankarda was there. Okay, yeah, yeah, Dipankarda. Dipankarda was there. Mm -hmm. At that time, Dipankar, he was Dipankar the Dipankar Chatterjee, right? Dipankar Chatterjee. Yeah. And and uh, the, uh, your head then uh, Onilda. Ekede. Yeah, Ekede, Ekede. Ekede, Ekede. 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 Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Those are history yes. now. Yes, that 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 was the history, and you know Shottojit Shorkar. Oh Shottojit. yeah, I know Shotto very well. Shottojit yes, Shorkar. yes, he he is my friend also. Oh okay. Yeah. yeah. Small world. <laughs> so yeah, it's a small world. Yes. <laughs> very small world. Very small world. Okay. Thank you. Sir, I called VC sir. Uh, VC sir said that he is trying to enter in the meeting, but somehow there is a technical problem. So uh, I think it we should start now. Continue with the sure. professor Mujumdar. Huh, okay. So uh, I sir, so, start so here. I should start with that present. Yeah, now, yeah, yeah, right? or, or yeah, yeah, share? yeah. How to screen share? Present now. Sir, present now. Present, present now. now. Okay. Yeah. Click on the present yeah. now. And screen. Hello. Am I audible? Yeah, yes, yes. I, I, perfectly all right. Yes, yes. You can see the screen? Yes, yes, sir. Can you can you see the screen? Yeah, uh, you go to the full screen mode, sir. Am I audible? Yes, you are perfectly all right. Yes. And am I audible? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, yes, okay. yes, you can talk. Yes, you, can okay. talk you can talk. Okay, it. let's start then. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I'm going to talk. Uh, hello, hello, everyone. So, good morning. Uh, although it is uh, close to morning here, it is 11.40. So, within 20 minutes, 12. So, next day morning. So, uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, and uh, first of all, you know, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's a really pleasure to talk in front of the students and a, a variety of uh, audiences here. So I'm going to talk about SARS-CoV-2 and from the molecular insights to the potential therapies and vaccines. So I'm going to touch a little bit everything just to give you a test what's going on in this field. So why first question is this is pandemic. So why it is pandemic? So look at this, this is the disease death per day record worldwide march 1st look the 3000 people were dying in tuberculosis and where is covid 19 there like 56 people average so this is the average of of last four or five years four to five years the how many people died and now look this is this is the result of march 28 COVID-19 exceeds everybody, but still tuberculosis is the second. So that's why this COVID-19 is pandemic. So this is the data as of today, just a couple of hours ago, I downloaded this data from the Johns Hopkins site, which is telling the global death rate, the global death rate is 4.63% and the death rate in India is 2.82%, about half, which is pretty good. But I'll come to a possible explanation of this, why, uh, at the sort of end of my talk. So let's discuss something about uh, coronavirus. So what is this coronavirus? What is the family of this virus? So this virus is the coronavirus family of virus. There is a family. And these are the, uh, sorry, uh, genus. So alpha coronavirus uh, that infects a pig, uh, beta coronavirus that infects bat, pangolin, human. That's SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2. Both are beta coronavirus. Gamma sir, coronavirus. Sir. Yes. Sir, uh, VC sir is there, I think. Uh, can I get a few minutes for him, please, sir? Sure, sure. 
VC sir, can you can you hear me, sir? VC sir, VC sir, are you here? VC sir, are you in the meeting? Sir, आपने बोला meeting है रोशन तो? हाँ, अमी आ ची, अमी आ ची. Sir, अमी आ ची. VC sir के VC sir के कि अमी phone कर बो. Sir, आपने एक बार एक और ना अमी एक हमें फांका रखे दी ची एक ता slot already. Vijay sir is here, I think. Okay. Yeah, I have joined. Okay, okay, sir. Uh, please, you are requested to officially uh, inaugurate the session and say a few words because the, our first speaker has already uh, start presenting. Presenting. So you were requested to officially inaugurate inaugurate the session. Please. So, 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 could I do it um, simultaneously? I mean, while he is speaking, uh, no, 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 I can no, 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 speak. no. He is actually uh, uh, stopping the session for you. Okay, 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 okay. So that is very kind of him. That is very kind of him, and the very outset today. Uh, good morning to him. Good morning to the respected speaker who was speaking, and good morning to all of you. Good morning to uh, to my greetings to the principal of the college, to the uh, to the teacher who has been contacting um, again and again. i think uh, there was little problem because there were two invitations and i was clicking on the invitation that came and that that has been changed they said that you know the timing has been changed or something like that anyway uh, okay. i was entering into the into the portal and then i was coming out so i really uh, could not understand what was happening anyway uh, finally this has been settled and uh, i am indeed uh, grateful to the college indeed grateful to the uh, to all of you to all the participants that you were uh, doing this webinar at a time when we are all locked down in a situation um, that is unprecedented we did not know about this uh, problem at all uh, in my 58 years of my life i never saw lockdown i never could understand what uh, uh, this meant to all of us but the point is we have been used to this uh, lockdown for the last 3 months and all of you know the reason the reason is that there is a virus which is uh, which is a round shaped kind of thing and uh, on, on the outside there are pin like spikes and those spikes are basically uh, rna uh, proteins and what really it does it puts um, it on the get stuck on the epithelial cells of the body goes straight into the lung causes a tremendous infection and uh, inflammation and then uh, causes different other things like uh, circulation problem um, uh, taste problem smell problem eye problem skin rash problem and what not and if it is not treated there is no medicine for this uh, particular thing there is no vaccine so it is basically an island which is not known and it has just that island has come and doing havoc on all of us yeah we have seen cyclone we have seen uh, other disasters but nothing like covid 19 because covid 19 is something that is a very dangerous kind of virus because it the the mortality rate of this virus is not very high but the point is the infection rate is something incredible incredible because uh, anyone who comes near this virus gets infected and gets infected and that is why we are asked to uh, be careful about ourselves to put mask on and to put um, uh, gloves on and things like that so that is one one picture and all of you know you are you are doing microbiology so all of you know and the drug discovery the vaccine discovery it is not it does not happen in one day it takes time to uh, really discover certain things it really takes time to uh, to uh, to understand the molecule to understand the antidote and to see on computer model how things uh, work out and how things really uh, match and mismatch and based on that what if there is any drug uh, 
uh, whether there is any side reaction of the drug so all these are are elaborate kind of thing where chemistry biochemistry microbiology biology uh, mathematics statistics everything every bit of it and and uh, social perception social understanding social acceptance everything is important every every bit of it is important so this covid 19 has put us into that kind of situation where we really do not know what to do so we are putting we are keeping ourselves inside initially for 15 days it was not a problem for all of us then gradually when two weeks passed we started asking questions uh, when it will go and now it has been used we are used to and it has been like you know it was a daily life that we are locked down in these circumstances particularly for teaching and learning process it is a very very bad thing for all of us there are uh, there are um, you know yesterday only uh, we were caught you know there will be examination there will be no examination there will be this there will be that you know we really do not know in what direction should we go how teaching and learning process will be done in spite of all the obstacles you know the teachers are philosophers the teacher said i you know the model of my teacher is basically socrates socrates is the model of my teacher because socrates is the person who has taught and you know in greece while you know while arguing and debating he has creating the created that debate club and socrates is the is the, is my is my model is my hero uh, so far as the teacher a teacher is concerned not ordinarily dressed almost you know bare bodied but you know as a very ordinary person he is asking the most difficult questions about about life and most difficult questions about about society most difficult question about polity and the most difficult question about uh, about uh, the uh, the uh, goings on in in our in our uh, life so these gentlemen socrates is if you think that you know he is our model he asked the some relevant questions during that time when those questions were not answered and today we are also in a situation of lockdown where we have to ask the relevant questions at a time when the answers are not known to any one of us and everyone is asking this question everyone is trying trying uh, through uh, through uh, webinars because seminars cannot be held trying through uh, virtual classrooms because classrooms cannot be approached trying through different ways when the main road is blocked when the lanes and bylanes are blocked we are going in the morning and everyone is having you know uh, some work at home in the morning but still the teachers have got up in the morning to discuss and deliberate and to find out the antidote how will it come people will discuss about the structure of the virus people will discuss how the structure of the virus uh, virus and the different ligands which can bind to it you know something like you know protein binding all of you know the binding process is also a very interesting uh, chemistry that you know you can call it the different forces covalent bond um, um, uh, um, uh, van der waals forces and different other forces that stick to that stick to something so you know and then structure of the protein there are amino acids what kind of thing you know peptides and how um, uh, those bonds will be will be inactivated and how you will uh, stop the uh, interaction with the epithelial cells these are some of the things which are being done in different labs but sadly we have not been able to find out the answer yet so that is why this lockdown we are taking precaution and we are also asking our students to take precaution but human civilization is powerful more powerful than anything else human civilization is more powerful than anything else it is a war between virus and us virus and us virus and us and i tell you in this virus and us united states is us but we are not talking about united states we are talking about this humanity at large so virus and us in this war i tell you the victory is predicted whose victory our victory human victory so we are trying to reach our students in different ways you are doing commendable job all of the all of the teachers i salute all of you i bow to all of you because you are taking all steps to uh, to uh, make aware of people what is the purpose of this webinar to make people aware of the situation to make uh, people aware once you are aware of the situations you you You, you can you can really fight uh, what what is there so this virus was unknown gradually it is being known it will be known and finally it will be defeated so that is my message this morning 
i i uh, admire my uh, teachers colleagues i admire my principal colleague i admire all the non teaching staff i admire all the all the students and participants and great speakers who are coming over here as vice chancellor it is my duty to 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 welcome all of you in fact uh, the, i consider every college affiliated to this university as my college so you are doing this job great job you uh, and i i i i uh, i praise you i admire you i put on record my sincere thanks to, for all of you and uh, uh, initial hiccups you know uh, i am sorry for that thank you thank you very much and uh, my my good wishes i inaugurate this seminar with my with my um, with all humility and i know that it will be highly successful thank you thanks to all of you thank, thank you, you very sir. much sir thank, thank you, you sir. very much sir uh, for you project thik ache to जीत Okay. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfectly all right. Hello. Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Perfect. Okay. Uh, let's move uh, uh, to the uh, phy phylogenetic relationship. That's what we are talking um, of the SARS-CoV-2. Where, where from it came? You know, in order to understand where from it came. you have to understand the phylogenesis of this virus so this virus is the human sars cov 2 is more close to pangolin than bat so it's between bat and pangolin but in terms of sequence it is more close to uh, manis javanica which is malayan pangolin so but yet the genome of sars cov 2 is slightly different than those two so the sars this is the lineage of sars cov phylogenesis and this is the phylogenesis of sars cov 2 but in, in both step bat plays a enormous role in a, in this and for sars cov 2 pangolin also plays a very important role and for sars cov bat and civet cat uh, plays a very important role so bat is common for both okay so detection so virus detection how you how we are detecting this virus these days so sample has been connect, uh, collected from the naso pharyngeal patient swab and then the sample transported uh, immediately heat inactivated lysis to kill the organism and then rna uh, will be extracted through running through a rna binding column where the uh, the virus gen genetic material is rna right so the rna will be bound uh, to the matrix and then will be looted and then amplification and detection so how we are detecting it first step of the detection is the reverse transcriptase so the reverse transcriptase will make a cdna copy of the rna and then followed by pcr amplification by tacman probe where the primer is coupled with the with the fluorescence probe and uh, the pcr will be amplified and we are measuring the measuring the fluorescence from the of the amplified product uh, by quantifying the photon so this is the this is the curve this is the delta ct value means uh, how much cycle number it takes to get it saturated uh, if it is if it is taking higher cycle number then it shows the titer is low and if it is taking lower cycle number then it is telling the titer is high means uh, means uh, very much positive and this could be questionable so maybe if you get this then maybe repeat test will be done but here so this is this is positive test so that's how we are detecting uh, sars cov 2 genomic rna this is a color contrasted electron microscopic image of the human lung cells that is infected with sars cov 2 the picture has been collected from the national institute of allergy and infectious disease from nih uh, the virus is about the size of the virus compared to other viruses is big it is like 
hundred nanometers. Where you are looking at it, is the so many uh, virus got stuck to the to the lung cell. So it lung is a is a primary target of this virus, and that's how it has been captured. This is the genomic organization of the uh, virus. So if you want to understand the virus, the 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 knowledge should start. Sir, अपना audio टा off होएगा ची कोनो कारणे। Sir, audio टा off होएगा ची अपना कोनो कारणे। अपना audio switch टा sir on करेनी नेक्ट तो। Am I audible? Okay, okay, okay. Now it's okay. Now it's okay. Now it's perfect, sir. Okay. Okay. Sir, start present. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you uh, you are audible, but present now, sir. Go to the present okay. now mode. Okay. Is it? Go to the present now mode, sir. You are out of the presentation. Hmm. At the right bottom part, present yes, now. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Present your slides, please. Is your real? Hello. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible. Can you see it? Yes, 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 sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this is the genomic organization of the virus. This is the largest gene, ORF one AB. So uh, there, there is a ribosomal frame frame shift when the so the the virus is using cellular ribosome to translate it, translate the protein. So the first protein it will make is either PP one A or PP one AB. So AB is the product of ORF1B when the ribosome passes through the through the ribosome frame shift signal, uh, ribosomal frame shift signal of the RNA. So, so but the whole protein, this protein uh, goes through proteolytic processing. The 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 uncut protein is not active. The protein will get active only when it is cut by the viral protease 3CL pro and PL2 pro. And um, I am coming to that. And here is the S protein, E, M, and N protein. These are the structural protein. None of these protein are structural protein. What is structural and non-structural protein? The non-structural protein virus will only make inside the cell during the infection. But the structural protein will be packaged into the mature virion. So S, the spike protein, is a structural protein. E protein. M protein, these are the membrane-bound uh, protein, and the N protein, nucleocapsid protein, that wraps the genomic RNA. So this is how the system works. This is the Cov2 genome, 30,000 RNA. This is the ORF1 AB protein, and uh, chopped by the by the viral protease. And one of the non-structural protein is NSP212. So this NSP212 is the heart of the virus, which is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. That is actually making the viral copy. So this enzyme, uh, you can tell this is the this is the heart of the virus. But spike protein S, which is the which is the glycoprotein and forms the spike, and this protein is very popular, and that's how you know the the, the globular structure of the virus, and you can see the spike protein now uh, that is coming out. And this protein is essential for entry into the host cell, and uh, target antigen. Most of the vaccine is targeting this. Spike protein. E protein is an envelope protein that is function as an ion channel, but not required for replication, but is very essential for pathogenesis. M protein is the membrane uh, matrix protein, so most abundant protein of the viral structure. So and they are the pro these protein actually place themselves in the viral membrane. A nucleocapsid protein, N protein, this protein wraps around the whole RNA. 
uh, genome to protect the RNA. So that's how the virus EQ itself. So this is a busy slide, but it is very important to understand how this virus is infecting cell and it is completing its life cycle. So the COV2, it enters the human cell by opening the cell receptor, which is S2. So angiotensin converting enzyme 2 and if you consider this is a highly efficient, S protein is the highly efficient key if you consider S2 is a lock. And this lock and key system takes help of another protease called TMPRSS2. Okay, this TMPRSS2 cuts between S1 and S2 and that facilitates the recognition by uh, angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor and the virus get internalized inside the cell. So once the virus is inside the cell, it's open up the genomic material, genomic RNA to the cellular ribosome and tell go and translate me. So the first product of translation is the ORF1AB. So this big protein will be made. However, I told you the, the uncut protein, the intact protein is dead. It cannot function until and unless it's being cleaved by the Caesar called 3CL Pro and a, another viral protease. So this this uh, Caesar is an attractive drug target. If you if you if you target this Caesar, if you inactivate this Caesar, then this protein cannot be processed. And NSP12, which is the RNA dependent RNA polymerase enzyme, that cannot be made. And as a result, virus cannot replicate. So this is a very attractive target. I will come to that. And once the NSP12 protein being made, so the virus is using the cellular machinery to generate, you know, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Once the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is being generated, then it will copy the viral genome. You should understand that this virus, the, 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 the mature virus packaged only the positive strand. It's a positive, positive strand RNA virus. So, and then RDRP, which is the um, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, this will copy the strand and then make minus strand. And from minus strand, again, it will copy to plus strand. Once this plus strand, so this is happening in enormous speed. You know, it's like a factory. So, and then this uh, uh, plus strand will be translated by the cellular ribosome. So virus do not have ribosome. But virus is ex a very cleverly exploiting the cellular protein synthesis machinery in order to synthesize its own protein. So the protein, E protein, M protein, N protein, and S protein, and accessory proteins, all of this protein will be made by the action of cellular ribosome on that viral template RNA. And then this uh, protein will be made. And very interesting uh, thing will happen here that the S protein, E protein, M protein will go through the cellular uh, uh, synthesis uh, secret secretory machinery. That means the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi part pathway for the membrane bound protein. And this will follow this pathway and then this protein will be made and also will be placed in the membrane. You know, that's where the virus need this protein. Very intelligent virus is using this pathway. And then it will reach the membrane by the time all membrane vir virus itself equipped all the membrane protein in, in its membrane and then snatch the membrane out from the cellular membrane. The virus is wrapped by the lipid. You know, you have to know that the virus cannot synthesize lipid and it is snatching the lipid out from the host membrane and then encapsulating itself. And then this is called the mature virion, which is coming by, by, by secreting out from the cell, by using the secretion machinery, or if the viral load is high, it can also uh, open by busting the cell out. This is called lysis. So both ways it can come out, it can come out. And next thing for, for the pathogenesis or infection of the virus is, is it will use the spike protein. So why this virus is highly infectious? So this uh, model will tell you. So what you are looking at, this is the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. The spike protein S can be divided into the S1 and S2 subunit. So the S1 subunit is the 
is the uh, receptor binding domain of the spike protein and it binds the s2 receptor which is, if you consider s2 is a lock and s1 subunit of s is a very efficient key so it will open up the key just by one chance it will it will it will it will it will, it will open up the key so if say 10 virus comes to the cell out of that 10 eight will be success successful opening up the key and enter the cell that is not true for for sars cov and mars these two virus are less infective uh, but uh, but more uh, uh, pathogenic it is lethal so lethality is more but but infectivity is less so this is the comparison of the affinity of the s protein of sars cov sars cov 2 and mars towards the cellular receptor and i will show you some the a very uh, important data uh, in support of this that why sars cov 2 is highly efficient in turning the cell that means why it is infectivity is high the it is uh, the reason is the affinity so affinity affinity and affinity so this is a, uh, a work uh, the what they have done they have measured the affinity that means the dissociation constant of the sars cov 2 s protein and the cellular receptor s2 protein so the dissociation constant is less uh, for for sars cov 2 uh, s protein compared to sars cov s and the mars s see mars is the middle east uh, respiratory syndrome virus you know that is also using not s2 but cd26 as a cellular receptor but the kd value is higher than this as you know from your maybe from your physical chemistry course that less the kd you know uh, more the affinity is so so here they have determined the kd value by biocode studies and the the kd value is more negative than this which shows that the affinity is high for cov 2s okay so why uh, this sars cov 2 targets multiple organ of human so it targets multiple organ it targets nasal cell it targets lung cell ileum intestinal cells heart cell eye liver all organ cell is a target because all cell express s2 uh, including pancreas pancreas you know the islet cell and the pancreatic ductal epithelium is also also target of this cell and you know that now the data is telling that islet cell uh, uh, it, it, it can 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 die so there is a down regulation in, in response to this virus of the pancreatic islet cell and there is mounting of clues are are building up that is telling that 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 this uh, coronavirus might trigger diabetes and there is a very nice database that COVID Diab Registry found by King's College London, where they are maintaining all the uh, how COVID uh, patients are, are, are uh, showing diabetic uh, symptom. And most of the organs that is uh, taking part into the glucose metabolism also express uh, S2. So, this, so that's why the connection is very, very close between COVID-19 and diabetes. Now you must have heard that, okay, now there is a theory going on that okay, this is a man-made virus, right? The conspiracy theory. So, so highly infectious property of human SARS-CoV-2 created by deliberate genome engineering. That's what some people believe and there is a debate. And But now I'll pr present you some data that is telling some evidence why it is not. And not only this data, I'll show you some more data. In support of that so this is the genomic rna of the virus and now i will help you to cruise uh, directly from the genomic rna right to the to the to the amino acid level what you are looking at the spike protein so this is the spike protein rna this is the spike protein protein sequence now you are looking at s1 subunit s2 subunit so s1 subunit is the receptor binding domain and now, uh, you know, enlarge this domain only, the receptor binding domain. So now if you see it, human SARS-CoV-2, bat, pangolin, and then more uh, two bat virus sequence has been uh, compared. And there is only very little difference, very little difference between these 
these five, which is uh, telling that sequence of the receptor binding domain of the spike protein S uh, of CoV2, bat SARS-CoV and pangolin SARS-CoV shows remarkable conservation. So the, so the virus is continuously trying to jump the species barrier by mutating the S protein, a process driven by the natural selection. But no, conspiracy theorists are not happy with that. So some of them are molecular biologists too, and they are demanding, oh, well, yeah, we understand these things. But if you look at the polybasic cleavage site, what is the importance of polybasic cleavage sites? Uh, I showed you in the previous model that this cleavage site uh, will be recognized by the TMP RSS2, another uh, protease that will chop it here. And then this cleavage is essential for infectivity for to bind the S1 subunit fully to the engage fully to the S, S2 protein. So if the cleavage is efficient, then the binding is also efficient. So now they are telling, no, look at here, SARS-CoV-2, all of a sudden there are four more extra amino acid got inserted here, five more extra amino acid got inserted here, which is not present here. So this is their logic, that why there is extra four amino acid in SARS-CoV-2 in the polybasic cleavage site. So this feature is new, not present in any other species, and this cannot be natural. So this is engineered. So this is their logic. Uh, so why this virus is man-made? In spite of there is tremendous conservation in the in the receptor binding to. Now I will show you some recent data uh, from just published in May, just a couple of months before, in Current Biology, the one of the good, very good journal in cell group of publication where they have found another coronavirus from bat that shows actually three amino acid insertion. Yeah, so a natural insertion of three amino acids. So there is only one amino acid difference between a natural insertion and, and, and SARS-CoV-2. So this insertion is naturally possible. So which is a strong evidence that why this virus is not man-made. Now I'll show you some reconstructed image using the cryo-electron microscopic data that has been built on the basis of protein data bank value. Uh, what you are looking at, the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 just at the time of engaging with the S2 receptor. So now this key will open this lock and the virus will enter. And the whole thing has been captured by the cryo-electron microscope analysis. Enormous information. So now I'll bring your attention to the structural biology aspects of this virus. That the structural biology is bringing a, actually a revolution in the discovery of uh, next generation of therapeutics against this virus in an unprecedented speed. speed. Again, what you're looking at cryo-electron microscope structure of the, of the, of the spike protein so this is the spike protein and this is the S2 cellular receptor protein. So now I have, uh, I enlarged this one. So what you're looking at, this is the, this is the spike protein. This is the cellular S2 receptor. So another uh, the, the pharmaceutical uh, or therapeutic approach to block. So the approach is how to block this interaction. So the approach is if you can flood the system with the soluble receptor, so then the soluble receptor will bind uh, the S2, soluble receptor S2 uh, will bind the S and as a result, the viral S protein will not get the chance to interact with the natural cellular receptor. So to tighter out it just by flooding the system with soluble S2, by recombinant soluble S2, that is one approach. But the another approach is uh, applying artificial intelligence now people can, uh, scientists can design molecule that will fit in that place, in this place. So this place, if you can block this place, the place, the atomic place between the, between the S protein and the S2 receptor, you can block this interaction. So now artificial intelligence or machine learning, uh, by using machine learning, the scientists are now designing molecules that will fit this place.
and many molecules has already been designed and they are under preclinical evaluation and some even under human clinical trial so i told you that uh, you know targeting the caesar is a is a very attractive target this is another aspects of the artificial intelligence so this is the this is the uh, structure the gray part is the structure of the 3cl pro virus that means the caesar of the virus that is cutting ORF AB and, and, and generating a lot of active protein. So if you block the caesar, then this cannot happen. So how to block the caesar? So the atomic structure of TCL Pro is this. And then artificial intelligence designed one, one compound called, called alpha ketoamide. And, and actually the scientists synthesized this compound. And that compound can, and, and the structural photograph has been taken of the of the compound and the and the 3cl pro, pro complex that exactly fits here and also there is preclinical evaluation of this actually is giving a very good observation that this compound can block the virus so this is uh, published in science in 20th march very all are recent uh, the paper that i'm showing here all of us you know remdesivir Okay, what is remdesivir? How remdesivir works? So this is the cryoelectronic microscopy. If you know how this inhibitor works, you have to rely these days on structural data. Nothing comes to come when it compares to structure. You know, no more good evidence than structural evidence. So here, this is the structure of the of the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So here you are seeing three more protein NSP7 and NSP8. And this is the interface, and these are different domain of RNA-dependent RNA polymers. Here, you are looking at the remdesivir, how the remdesivir structure fits. This is this part is remdesivir, and this part is the structure of the RNA part. So there is a perfect complex between remdesivir and RNA-dependent RNA polymers. So that's why remdesivir will be will be incorporated into the RNA. This is actually a nucleoside analog. So the enzyme will incorporate, it looks like an RNA, a uh, nucleoside. So enzyme cannot differentiate. It fits so well here. So, and then this will be incorporated. And as a result, the chain extension will be stopped. The chain and term, chain termination will happen. A new viral RNA cannot be synthesized. That's how remdesivir works. And there is another structural analog called febipiravir. So which is the structural analog of remdesivir. Uh, also uh, is giving very good result this has been originated from japan and originally used as a as a as a drug for flu but it also works for 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 sars cov 2 and gives a very good result in human clinical trial in harvard medical school and this is being now being used in 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 many clinic um, but still the part of part of uh, phase 3 trial i think now i will mm, i will cruise through a little bit complex territory of this virus the drug discovery uh, complex territory so in order to know so what will be the potential uh, future therapeutics of this virus you know so you have to know how to how to how to how to model the virus and cellular protein interactions so here you are looking at thousands of, this is the cellular protein. You are looking at thousands of protein of a human cell that communicates between each other in order to keep the keep us healthy. So every time in our system, all the proteins of our cells are communicating. They are not, uh, uh, you know, uh, keeping themselves uh, shut down. You know, they are communicating between each other all the time. What virus does, so vi when virus enters, virus job, is to how to break the communication now you listen carefully here these are the virus model i just took help that colored model colored ball at the viral protein ash colored ball at the cellular protein and the square shape is the cross point between the viral protein and the cellular protein where the viral protein can interact with cellular protein these are the cross points and any drug that will that will can 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 shut down this virus should target this this uh, 
uh, square shaped box that means that means will not allow the to disrupt the cellular protein by the virus so they will they will just block this this square shaped box why i'm telling this all these things because nowadays there is a enormous emphasis on drug discovery from already repurposed drug because when pandemic happens there is not that much time to do a uh, phase 1 2 3 clinical trial for all newly discovered drug so what it is advantages is if you could find antiviral property from already some already <coughs> known drug that is in the market so for the safety trial has been done so no elaborate safety trial is is necessary it can right away it can go so if you can prove that this uh, uh, this this drug can work against the virus so now i will uh, i'm really sorry so this is really a little bit more complicated how actually uh, the the state of the art research is going on in drug discovery field against sars cov 2 so they are telling again artificial intelligence is playing an enormous role in network building so so now they are analyzing the huge data from the gene expression omnibus so what is gene expression omnibus or geo site where people are depositing their 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 gene expression data that is coming from the from the next generation rna sequence rna seq data so since these are repurposed drug it is very likely that many people have already done research that how how, how the global gene expression is changing in response to those drugs and they are depositing those data in the geo site and now the data scientist is uh, digging that data and then building this network and then predicting that how so again here the ash colored ball is point of contact between the cellular protein and viral protein so this network has been generated by digging the data from the gene expression omnibus site geo site so the colored ball is the point of contact between the cellular protein and normal uh, cellular protein that regulates normal physiological function and and the and the artificial intelligence will look for which drug can in, can can induce a gene expression status that can disrupt the communication between the virus and the cellular protein and that's how they are predicting okay this could be the so this way they have predicted many drug from the already repurposed drug you know uh, uh, for uh, actually remdesivir is also showing positive result from this from this data <clears throat> and not only remdesivir there are a big group of drug drugs you know like camphor mesalzine quinacrine uh, dactinomycin all of these drugs are 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 predicted drug that can work against uh, sars cov 2 and and the clinical trial is going on now so they have shortlisted you know many drug from the already repurposed drug now i'll come to the to the immunological aspects of this uh, virus that uh, uh, as you know that the prior knowledge of immune regulation by sars cov and mars already helps to predict what could be the immune response of this sars cov 2 lot of work has been done already of the previous sars cov and mars virus and and these are the these are the summary of this work so when when virus enters the cell you know many of the viral proteins acts as a ion channel protein and through ion channel activation they can activate the nlr nlrp3 in somasome activation that can convert the pro il1 beta to il1 beta and il1 beta is an inflammatory cytokine called spiroptosis uh create can initiate pyroptosis so and also it can viral virus can split the genomic rna which is a single stranded rna and single stranded rna by itself through the tl tlr toll like receptor 7 and 8 pathway activates uh, the activates the signaling cascade that activates nf kappa b nf kappa b locates to the nucleus and then activates pro inflammatory cytokine il6 and tnf alpha you know il6 is one of the cytokine that is taking place an enormous role in the cytokine storm caused by this virus and not only il6 you know the the single stranded rna can also form double stranded rna in the infected cell and once the double stranded rna form it can activate rigai 
MDA5 MAB S dependent pathway that can activate RF7, RF3. Both can translocate to the nucleus and turn on the interferons, the interferon alpha and interferon beta gene. And not only that, this interferon goes, comes out, and then again triggered bind to the interferon receptor, and then triggered jack stat pathway, another signal transaction pathway that again activates ISRE and again uh, produce lots of RNAzL and 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 many other pro-inflammatory proteins. So once inflammation initiates, so it is a vicious cycle. It it goes on and on, and ultimately creates the cytokine storm. You know, virus itself do not cause that much damage to the human. To be honest, virus is not causing the damage. What is causing the damage? Why people are dying? Because of the hyperinflammatory response caused by the overactive innate immune system that brings severe pathological outcome and death. So everything is the hyper inflammation response. So I'll come to this so uh, point again later. I'm I'm I'm, I'm keeping this now. So let's uh, let's talk about what is happening in the lung. So the lung pathology. So this is an infected patient's lung you are looking at, and this is the alveolar lung alveolar. You know, lung is actually looks like this. You know, and what is happening here? This is carbon dioxide to oxygen exchange that's the that's the primary job of the lung exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen and by the way here yeah, this is a post mortem sample of a patient that died from sars cov 2 and here we are looking at how 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 this virus got got you know embedded in in the in the in the in the in the lung tissue okay so in the normal lung uh, this exchange happens very efficiently that's how you know we are breathing. Everything is fine. When when inflammation happens, so all of these cytokines generate cytokine storm, and then lung cell secretes fluid. You know these these alveolar secretes fluid and filled with bronchoalveolar lavage fluid here, yeah. and that severely severely compromise this exchange. That's the reason why, if this stage comes, why patient needs rest. Uh, like uh, uh, respirator or uh, you know intubation uh, to for for survival of the of the of the patient and that's happening in ICU. Okay, so now I will talk uh, talk more uh, about what is the cause of this over inflammation. So in order to understand that, you have to understand a little bit about the character of our immune cell. So there is a dynamic equilibrium exist. We have inflammatory immune cell, we have anti-inflammatory immune cell. And a large number of immune cell in between inflammatory, totally inflammatory and totally anti-inflammatory. So the system, so there is a gradient here and the system is very plastic. So the, so the relative number of this diverse immune cell actually determine the resultant inflammation in the infected patient's body how much inflammation uh, the patient will experience that depends on this uh, on this equilibrium between the inflammatory immune cell and anti-inflammatory immune cell so this is actually a double-edged sword if it is too low then susceptible to infection we will be so in, inflammation plays a big role it is actually protecting us from from infection but if it is too high, so then it is lethal to the host. So it is like a ammunition. So if you do not control, if you do not know whom to shoot, so and indiscriminately shooting, um, firing, so so you may die by your own fire, and that's what happening in, in the in the in the in the hyperinflammatory stage of SARS-CoV-2, and patients who are getting severely ill. But if the cell knows how to make a proper balance between this, that's called trained immunity. And these trained immunity people will not be over inflamed, you know. So, and how trained immunity can generate? If you are staying totally in a germ-free environment, like so-called healthy environment, so you don't know how to maintain this balance. So you are fine under normal condition, your inflammation is low, uh, 
they ha that have some beneficial effect too but if you are challenged by 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 a real real demon or the pathogen then you don't know how to maintain the balance so your cell will go ballistic and every all the equilibrium will shift towards the towards the inflammatory immune cell and 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 patient will be very very sick so so staying in germ free and uh, germ free environment is not good so this is the reason that why you know the death rate is high in the in the in the western society and this is the reason what is why the death rate is low compared to the world death rate uh, in in the country where most of the people uh, have not stayed in fully germ free environment like like india so uh, uh, this is one of the system that is telling how increasing innate immunity also might help by using the bcg vaccination so this is a, this is proven so the percentage of severely ill patient and the death varies from country to country you are see india japan portugal and many african country where bcg vaccine was given their death rate is low in addition to the specific um, you know effect against tuberculosis bcg is against tuberculosis but in addition to that it has many off target beneficial effect that a immune system against wide varieties of infection and this vaccination can induce trained immunity a large part of this mechanism how this is this is vaccination induced trained immunity is also known it is actually induces metabolic and epigenetic changes in the genome of the immune cell that is helping the balance of the inflammatory and anti inflammatory cells and inducing trained immunity so this is the reason why so in randomized control trial that is going on in netherlands and australia australia trial is almost complete is very close to completion actually and so far the data is telling that it is uh, they are protecting 55 to 58% of people so it's a very good result in clinical trial and there are proven uh publications that the work has been done that shows that how bcg vaccination protects against experimental viral infection so cell host host and microbe published it and there's a very excellent review how bcg induced cross protection uh, can happen and how uh, defining trained immunity and its role in health and disease so bcg vaccination so far is induces trained immunity and the outcome is very good so for covid 19 you will also see that there is a huge difference in the pathological response between individual so even in the same country one group of individual may be more susceptible somebody somebody is less susceptible like 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 silent uh, maybe got it but nothing happened and that kind of individuals are also there so why for some sars cov2 infected individual the immune response suddenly taking a wrong turn but some but for some people even with 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 age you know age is a general factor but there are plenty of evidence that even even um, uh, you know young individual also uh, got severely ill so i'll tell you some clue on that so there is a recent study um, published in last month Uh, uh, in New England Journal of Medicine, that is telling genome-wide association study of severe COVID-19 with respiratory failure. So this is an excellent study and bold study. So scientists from Italy, Spain, Germany, and Norway say they perform genome-wide association studies of the disease severity (GWAS). So what is GWAS? So this method is actually based on sequencing, sequencing the whole genome. of uh, it searches in the genome for small variation because because uh, my genome sequence and your genome sequence is almost identical except there are little bit variation uh, between you and me in terms of snp so they are looking at those those changes so they have accomplished the whole genome sequencing of 2000 covid 19 patients like like with control and uh, you know severely ill not that severely ill and for severely ill patient who died on account of the covid-19 generated cytokine storm 
they actually they have analyzed you know this many number of SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphism, and they have identified several SNPs in six genes like SLCA20, LZT, FL1, CCR9, FICO1, CXCR7, XCR1. In chromosome number three, locus, this is the locus with very high level of significance and high degree of confidence. This is actually the data. What you're looking at the log p value, which is telling the significance of the data. And this is the chromosome. So these are the 23 pairs of chromosome. And they have identified a cluster of genes that is showing SNPs in, in, in chromosome number three uh, in, in, in location locus 3p21.31 locus. This is exactly this locus, a cluster of genes. And so what could be the potential connection between the presence of SNPs and the disease severity? So most of the proteins encoded by these gene clusters are inflammatory proteins, So which is the proof of, uh, proof of principle of this uh, study. So their expression are supposed to be so most of the time our inflammatory gene expressions, expressions are very tightly regulated. But when SNPs, so if the gene unfortunately carry the SNPs, then the regulatory sequence can be can be gone with little SNP, with little trigger it can be it can go ballistic expression of of inflammatory protein and that might produce cytokine storm. So this is an enormous interesting observation that can that can um, more work is needed, but this work can can come up with a with a predictability predictability value by by sequencing human genome that who whose chance might be might be more and we are actually going to that direction now let's uh, talk a little bit about the vaccine uh, again the immunological aspects of this to get natural immunity against the virus you have to get the natural infection right but natural infection is dangerous you know it can make you seriously ill although you will have protective antibody but there is a chance that that you might end up in ICU. So that's why the term vaccination comes. That vaccination is a process of inducing artificial immunity by using a structural antigen or a weak version of the virus by exploiting the same adaptive immune response. So what is actually happening during vaccination? So 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 in a natural infection or vaccination. So the, the first thing the protein, the viral protein or the virus will encounter is the antigen presenting cell or macrophage. So macrophage will engulf the protein and then the, it will display the protein in terms of viral antigen display in the surface of the, mic, of the, of the macrophage. And that will be recognized by the naive T cell. Once naive T cell got recognized by viral antigen displayed on the surface of the antigen presenting cells so the t cells will 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 generate uh, cd4 plus t cell knife's t cell will be converted to cd4 plus t cell and cd8 plus t cell both t cells are inflammatory and highly produce produce cytokines so cd so these are the natural killer cell also can in can can kill the infected cell so this 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 cd8 plus uh, t cells so cd4 plus t cell so all of these T cell will will secrete very uh, inflammatory cytokines and also humoral factors that will induce B cell to produce plasma cell and then plasma cell will produce antibody and that antibody will 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 block the virus to infect uh, during uh, the infection. This is a this is a almost the immunology 101 of the virus course. Okay, now you must have heard uh, the the name of the Oxford Institute, Jenner Institute, Oxford University, who are making the one of the viral vaccine. So they are also targeting S protein. So what they are doing, the gene sequence of SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, they insert it into the adenovirus, and this adenovirus is actually cause little bit of cold symptom to chimpanzee, but cannot produce uh, cause any weakness or any disease to human. So they inserted the gene in the adenovirus and then injected the adenovirus. So adenovirus is just a, just as a vehicle. 
injected it into the into the arm of the of the of the of the volunteers and then it will so the so the adenovirus will enter the system and then the s protein will be made will be recognized by the by the by the antigen presenting cell display the viral antigen recognized by t helper cell or night t cell convert cytotoxic t cell and induce b cell and also then b cell will produce antibody and this antibody uh, will uh, supposed to protect us and also during this process the long lived memory b and t cell will also will be made and they will be uh, patrol our body and in future if we are infected then the b cell will immediately produce produce uh, antibody and then uh, cytotoxic t cell will also immediately kill the viral infected cell and that's how we will be protected from infection so uh, this is one one way another way um, uh, that vaccine production is going on in us from the moderna in collaboration with national institute of allergy and infectious disease they are also using spike protein but they are using the spike protein rna so they are not using the protein they are using the rna encapsulated with a nanoparticle and then injected that into the into the human body so then inside the body inside the cell the these rna will be will be released and then cells ribosome will will make the viral make the viral protein and then again then the same thing will happen so it will be presented by antigen presenting cell they display the viral antigen recognized by night t cell and the night t cell will convert it to the cd4 plus t cell cd8 plus t cell which is this cell is cytotoxic will kill the infected cell and this cell will make the humoral factor that will induce b cell to produce antibody okay and this strategy has been tested before in 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 rhesus monkeys that this actually injecting rna you can you can get antibody um, so uh, why the result of phase 1 clinical trial of the mrna vaccine conducted by moderna is highly encouraging although this is a so far they have done phase 1 and phase 2 with with small number of people and now from this month is actually phase 3 uh, should uh, should start uh, i don't know the exact uh, uh, result but but very soon they will they will publish the result of phase 3 uh, intermediate result of phase 3 so each participant will receive different doses of this virus uh, in this viral protein in these three groups and then intramuscular injection and then after several day blood will be collected and then it will be they will look for 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 the presence of neutralizing antibody and so far the result is very good they have identified neutralizing antibody and the result is very good for moderna also the result is good for the for the oxford vaccine also at this moment but the critical stage is phase 3 when the volunteers who got the vaccine will actually get the real virus and now what what will happen so that is the million dollar question we don't know the answer yet but all of us are are eagerly waiting at this point so moderna is telling that it uh, is expecting that if everything goes fine so the vaccine will be ready in uh, in 2021 early 2021 So there are one more company in Codagenics in collaboration with Serum Institute of Pune with an Indian company. Also, they are trying to make a conventionally weakened virus uh, version of the virus um, and uh, injecting them uh, in the in the in the cell. Uh, in the uh, did I don't think they have started human clinical trial yet. They're still in the preclinical trial mode and and but they have got antibody response. that's uh, my information is telling but there is no published uh, phase 1 or phase 2 clinical trial yet from this so this is actually the the whole scheme so what it takes why you know a vaccine will take a lot of time so there are different stages so let me go through through this in order to give you a test of the vaccine what is actually happening in this front so this is a virus particle so you can to make the vaccine you can adapt it for vaccine by weakening the virus it may be the attenuated virus or introducing mutation in the virus will so this version of the virus will not produce produce disease or pathogenesis but will trigger the immune response so you can kill the virus this is heat inactivated virus or you can isolate different piece of the virus and then inject those piece 
or you can make the sequence the virus and make the genetic blueprint of the virus embed the blueprint into a dna based plasmid or rna lipid capsule this is going on uh, happening in the in the uh, modern uh, uh, trial and this is happening in actually the the oxford uh, general institute trial uh, or astrazeneca now uh, trial so all of them so you put into a solution particle solution and then test the solution so this is the next step so this is the uh, test a viral, a viral antigen under test first thing you will test in the preclinical trial in the lab cell culture and animal now whether it can it can block viral replication in cell culture and then if it pass then you test the toxicity of this prep in the animal if okay. it is if it is toxic then hello am i audible hello hello Yes, sir. You are audible. So it's okay. Yes, sir. Fine, fine. There is no okay. problem. Okay, okay. Then, if it is toxic, then you have to stop it. You cannot move. But if it is not toxic, then you go to the next step. So then, the next step is: Does it prompt the immune uh, system uh, cells to produce antibody? So this is the this is the next step. If it is yes, so everything is this step up to here is preclinical, not even in clinical trial. if the answer is yes then you go to the phase 1 clinical trial so if the vaccine is safe you inject the vaccine itself to the to, to, to the to the volunteer and whether it injecting the vaccine itself is creating any bad thing you have to look at that even without uh, before uh, they uh, being chased by the virus so this is phase 1 phase 2 uh, phase 1 is typically 10 to 100 people phase 2 is is little bit more number of people Hundred people are essentially same thing: safety and whether it creates the immune response. Once you pass these two, then you go to the to the real uh, test, which is phase three. So, does it safely prevent infection? Because why you are why you will take vaccine? You will not take vaccine just only just injecting the vaccine itself is safe. That's not the purpose. Your real purpose to take the vaccine is you will be vaccinated. and then we you and you will see the real virus you will be protected that's the purpose that should be tested here in in thousands and thousands of people that's why phase 3 must take should take long time is not a matter of joke in phase 3 but not only this you know you have to test the antibody response you have to test whether neutralizing antibody is happening or non neutralizing antibody is happening i'll come to that point So it's a very important point here. Now let's discuss what are the challenge. Why vaccine takes time? What are the challenges in the vaccine world? So if the intensity of the COVID-19 pandemic got significantly reduced, say the pandemic is gone, then you know it will make the phase two, three clinical trial extremely hard because the control group, the way you are doing the trial is you are injecting the control group just the placebo. and the and the treated group the real uh, vaccine but they will not know who got what it is called double blind placebo control trial which is the hallmark of phase 3 trial and then they will go to the to the to the society and face the virus and then uh, what will happen to them but if the pandemic is gone then uh, it is possible that that the control group and the, and the and the and the vaccinated group nothing happened so that study will be inconclusive so to 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 conduct vaccine trial it is also important that that the pandemic should be there so without its real application in the field it will be hard to assess the efficiencies of the memory b and t cell so this is impossible to predict you know what will be the efficiency without actually doing the trial so sars cov2 is continuously mutating so whether you know the 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 vaccine will be uh, will work against the mutant version of the virus so although now there is a universal vaccine platform for flu is already there and but it will take long time to make the universal vaccine platform for sars cov2 and already this is a very recent paper that i saw published in cell that uh, there is a, a mutant virus has been evolved that shows very high infectivity 
that aspartic acid at position 614 changed to glycine. But fortunately, fortunately, this virus, although it is highly infective, but not causing uh, uh, high pathogenesis. And fortunately, you know, the, the, uh, this mutation will not uh, compromise the efficiency of the, of, the, of the vaccine because they have covered, uh, it is not within the, within the epitope. Uh, so far, the epitope mapping data is telling, which is a good thing. So the COVID-19 infection, another bad thing is with COVID-19 infection, uh, uh, what we know that it reduces the CD4 plus and CD8 plus T cell in some individual, not for all. As you have seen in my earlier slide that how important these two cells are to induce B cell to produce antibody. If these cells numbers are reduced sir, in this... Sir. Sir, yes. sir, sorry, sir, you are not in the present now mode. Someone has entered and it stopped the present now mode. Please, sir, you just on from the present now mode. Mm. Someone disrupted that. Okay. Kindly go through the present now again. Is it okay now? Okay, okay, sir. Okay, full screen. Full screen, please. Yeah, one minute. All the participants are requested not to go to the present now mode. All the participants are requested for that. Is it, is it okay now? Oh, it's okay, sir. Perfect. Okay. It's perfect. Okay. So if, if it is reducing the CD4 plus CD8 plus T cells in some patients, then, you know, their, their, their uh, antibody generating system will be severely compromised. So it is quite possible that the vaccine, even the vaccine is good, it may not work fully. Uh, not everybody will, may not get the full benefit from the vaccine. Uh, so now I will also like to mention that the dark side of fast tracking the vaccine development, you will see that now everybody is pushing, oh, we need the vaccine. So let's fast track the phase three and all this thing. So I'll discuss the actual danger for that. So phase three trial, and there is an excellent review published in Nature Review Immunology, the potential danger of suboptimal antibody response. So the phase three trial should test the vaccine on a large cohort of actual for the actual efficacy against infection and the potential adverse effect. So what could be the adverse effect? You will see that now. So the phase three trial required that infection among the control, control group is sufficiently high. The, the group that, that got the placebo, they are highly infected. You know? That's the expected result. But still, some are advocating under this condition that for not doing the phase three trial elaborately and relying solely on evidence of the neutralizing antibody response. So this could bring actually a dangerous situation. So we should not and must not forget the dark history of vaccine development for respiratory syncytial virus. This is another respiratory virus, human. It, it infects child. And there are uh, instances that where the vaccinated children, vaccinated children got seriously ill and some even died when actual infection came from the field. So this is not a, not a matter of joke. This is a serious business and one should do the phase three trial with, with, with utmost importance and, and, and very highly intense manner. So the history of vaccine is bright for the pox, pox, uh, polio, polio virus, uh, mumps, and rabies virus. But however, it is not so bright for RSV, dengue, Ebola, HIV. Why? Because the antibody dependent enhancement effect. So this is a dark, real, and documented episode behind the saga of many vaccines. And one should not forget that. So ignoring the requirement of a large scale double blind placebo control phase three trial, 
targeted to determine the actual efficacy and potential adverse effect will miss the chance of catching the ADE effect. And what is ADE effect? You will see it now. This could bring a bad consequences to the vaccinated people when they will face actual infection. What is ADE? The ADE effect is called antibody dependent enhancement. When you are injecting an antigen, so antibody will be made. So for a good vaccine, most of the antibody will be neutralizing antibody. So the neutralizing antibody will, will bind the virus and immediately inactivate the virus and will not allow the virus to bind the receptor and everything is stopped here. So no infection. However, in reality, some non-neutralizing antibody will also be made. But if the non-neutralizing antibody is, is higher proportion, there is always be a ratio. So that's why phase three is important, uh, you know, to, to, to see all of this in detail, check all of this in detail. So non-neutralizing antibody, if it is high, unfortunately, this will bind the virus. But binding of non-neutralizing antibody to the virus will not kill the virus. But what will happen, this non-neutralizing antibody will bind the antibody receptor, which is the FCR, FC receptor, that all of our cell has this receptor. And this antibody in one hand will grab the virus and in another hand will grab the cell. And by this grabbing, the, it will bring the virus close to the cell and an infection will be high in presence of non-neutralizing antibody. And not only that, this binding might trigger TLR8, not might, will trigger TLR8. It has been, it's shown, uh, it is in, this review covers all those work. And pro-inflammatory cytokine that can contribute to the cytokine storm. So a bad vaccine may not be good, may give, uh, you know, devastating consequences. So that's why it is important to study thoroughly the phase three and, and, and look at every aspect of the, of the character of the antibody, what kind of antibody is generating, and whether the people who got the vaccine and, and are getting seriously ill or not. On a large cohort of study, it should be done. When they will face the actual virus. If they are not facing the virus, if they, then this study will be inconclusive. So this is a, I'm almost in the last part of this, of my talk, that this is the coronavirus vaccine tracker. This is July 3rd, I look. Um, so 125 preclinical candidate. One is actually approved. You, don't, you know, this is from Canson Bio. This is in China. So for all other, this is phase two, but they have given limited approval to use uh, for their military. Uh, this is only one officially approved vaccine in China. Moderna phase two, uh, this is the Oxford uh, vaccine, phase two and phase three very pretty soon will start and many other company in different phase of the virus, uh, of, of, the, of the vaccine tra trial. And you know that in vaccine trial in India, Bharat Biotech, that is that uh, telling even the phase one, phase two trial is, I don't know whether it begin, it's supposed to begin now, but Unfortunately, I, I don't know whether it is true. There is a there is a deadline for August 15, which I think is very uh, unrealistic deadline. And another company, Zydus, is also uh, in India, is also uh, 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 making a DNA-based virus vaccine. And really, uh, I hope, you know, both of them will be successful uh, after a, a thorough uh, phase three study. So I will stop here. It is really a pleasure and I'll take any question. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for your lucid presentation and very informative presentation. Thank you very much, sir. So uh, the next speaker, he is already in. So I will take only a few questions. And I think uh, in uh, Cleveland now it's 1 p.m. 1 a.m. Yes. night. 1 a.m. So oh, that's okay. 1 a.m. You know? Exactly I'm 1 a.m. So, so I'm not <laughs> going to bother you anymore. So I'm taking very few questions. And for that.
the participants can put the uh, if you have any question the participants are requested to put on put in in the chat box right yeah chat or you can tell the question uh, i don't uh, uh, let's or if you if if anyone okay so i am finding one question uh, professor ratna china from indus college she is asking is both the neutralizing and non neutralizing produced non neutralizing produced by the same b cell yes then yes, why b, the b, difference yes yes yeah, b, b cell actually arises? produced b cell actually not b cell the antibody being produced by the by the next uh, differentiation of the b cell which is plasma cell but yes they are they are being produced by the same 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 b cell uh, no. no same b cell means that not the same cell but the same population of the cell uh, one b cell is producing uh, producing uh, neutralizing antibody not there is only not one cell there are several cells several b cells are producing antibody so some population of b cell may be producing uh, non neutralizing antibody and that will actually happen in so not like that that 100% antibody is neutralizing antibody that's not going to happen in reality so that's why it is important to 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 check it you know, the the proportion of neutralizing and non neutralizing antibody okay thank you sir and the question is there if there is memory cells then why we see second cycle of infection no if the if the if the second cycle of infection <laughs> second cycle of infection is 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 really controversial so the 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 the, the... shubhasri shubhasri audio off please uh, please put off your audio shubhas most of the time most of the time an individual who will get infected and survive you know very less chance that he will be infected again until and unless he has a problem in the in the in the in the in the t cell as we know virus is mutating very first worldwide will vaccine work on all the mutating virus with same response yes most you know we can it's not guaranteed but most of the time when they are generating the 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 the, the antigen you know they are covering the hot mutation hot spot so now one can one can predict you know which will be the hot spot and and they can they can they can cover those right and and not only that they will they will map the map the epitopes you know of the antibody and that way also they can predict whether whether this mutation will compromise this vaccine vaccine or not so those are the follow up studies but again it is not guaranteed that that any uh, all of a sudden any new mutation uh, may overcome the vaccine that's yes that's a possibility too but can most of the time it's not okay. uh, can covid 19 affect our digestive system oh uh, yes because covid 19 you know our digestive system cells uh, has a uh, is to receptor and 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 it can screw up the digestive uh, digestive system you know but most of the time uh, you know uh, uh, people get, will get recovered recovered uh, soon uh, okay you know, still, still it is okay. an 85% of the people are not going through serious uh, condition only 10 to 15% people are getting seriously ill and out of that only 2.2 to 3% people are actually dying okay thank you very much sir thank you it's for a pleasure everything ev everything for everything sir so okay so now we are going to we are moving for the second speaker he is with us and he is a very going through a very uh, busy schedule so our next speaker is uh, dr professor shubhankar choudhury professor he is a professor and head of endocrinology ipgmer and sskm hospital calcutta he is editor in chief indian journal of endocrinology and metabolism he is the former president of endocrine society of india he is a member subject expert committee cdcsco government of india he is the founder patron 
South Asian Federation of Endocrine Society, and he is a president of Endocrine Society of Bengal. His current research interest focuses on gut microbiome and gestational diabetes mellitus pathogenesis of Graves of, of orbitopathy and the biology of fat in different body components. He has 188 publications in peer-reviewed journals of international reviews. So he needs no such introduction. So I have, it's over to sir. Sir, you can proceed now. So I can't hear you. So I can't hear you. So I can't hear you, sir. Hello. 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 Hello, sir. Hey, sir, I'm not going to show you how to do it. Hey, sir, slide will ask you. Is your slide will be ready? No, sir, you move the slide me. If I was slide, I say, I'm not sure. I can't pop it. I can't don't think as a slide. Sir, apna roi yeta off roi chhe. Audio ta apna off hoy roi chhe dekchi. Apna roi pura dekha chhe sir. Apna roi screen ta roi pura dekha chhe. Ha, ebar ek sir, thik achi bolay. Sir, Shona Jatshin, I'm not going to. Sir, Shona Jatshin, I'm not going to. Shona Jatshin, I'm not going to. Our screen is not continuously fluctuate. Now it's okay, fine. Sir, I'm not going to. No, sir. Still now it's not audible. The slide is okay, fine, it's coming, but even not audible still, sir. Okay, okay, sir, okay.
एपी यादव यू आर सर योर ऑडियो इज टर्न ऑफ योर ऑडियो इज टर्न ऑफ स्टील इट्स शोइंग दैट इट्स ऑडियो इज यस सर प्लीज गो टू द प्रेजेंट नाउ मोड प्रेजेंट Now it's okay, okay, sir. It's now audible. It's audible now. Audible, but yes, now yes. I have to get my slides. Yeah. So go to the present now mode. Yes. Now the slides. Visible. Yes, 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 yes. It's visible and, and you are perfectly well. and you. you are perfectly audible. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, sir. Sorry for that delay. right so very, very good morning sir very good morning to all of you and if dr barshan jit majum that is still around it's still morning for him as well it's past 1 o'clock right so we are passing through uh, difficult days uh, in terms of covid 19 and i say it's particularly difficult because we have all realized that we cannot keep everything shut indefinitely the lockdown cannot continue indefinitely essential activities has to go on the economy has to roll and we are doing that we have opened up at a time when still we are having more and more new patients being affected by covid so we all have to be particularly careful uh, to remain safe to protect us from this covid 19 so what we i should try and do and uh, i already lost a little bit of time uh, because of this technical issues uh, but what i would like to do is maybe present initially a little bit of uh, background in relation to covid and then about diabetes uh, before i finally wind off and i must say that uh, my job has been made so much easier by this elaborate discussion on the basics of covid 19 Uh, or, or rather the SARS-CoV-2 virus and i'm really thankful to dr pigoshan and his team at microbiology department at potajil uh, college for providing me a sort of outsider a clinician to be part of this very important international webinar so uh, this is of course an ever changing chart uh, so this was two days back and already the numbers are much different and we know worldwide there are more than 11 million cases of covid-19 and there are more than almost 5 and a half lakh deaths and we now know we have just about oh, just recently two days back beaten russia to come to the third place in in, in terms of the number of uh, people who have got diagnosed covid of course usa tops the list and uh, i'll just quickly uh, sort of take us through uh, the viruses behind uh, the colds and flus uh, because we know this uh, covid-19 is actually a sort of a uh, exaggerated version of a cold or a flu so uh, we all as adults uh, have uh, two to five colds in a year as a child possibly you have double the number uh, your immunity has not developed enough and which usually runs a benign course gets over uh, with a uh, sneezing a cough and uh, stuffy nose a little bit of fever and body pain and it's over by 7 days now if you look at the viruses that cause this common cold almost 50% are caused by rhinoviruses which are small viruses 30 nanometers of which three species affect humans 
The next most common are the coronaviruses. The coronaviruses are the ones which are causing this COVID-19. About 10 to 15 percent of all colds are caused by coronaviruses, of which there are seven species. Four of them are quite benign, and only three, as we have heard, and maybe I shall uh, also have a question to refer to, uh, are associated with more severe illness. Now, these are bigger viruses, but four times the size of the rhinovirus. And another group of viruses, the influenza viruses, could also cause a relatively milder cause of the flu, but it could also run a more severe course, and it could even also give rise to death, mortality, especially in the elderly people or those who have compromised lung or heart function. So about 10% uh, of all colds could also be caused by influenza viruses, which are also bigger in size. And then you can have a host of other viruses, respiratory, sensitive virus, and so on. Now, uh, just to reiterate that of the seven known strains of coronavirus that infect humans, four of which cause just a common cold, the three more severe ones started with SARS-CoV in 2005, then we had the MERS-CoV in 2012, and then now we have the SARS-CoV-2 uh, in 2019, extending to 2020, and we don't see actually quite an end to it yet, uh, which are associated with more severe disease. And it would, of course, take an entire webinar to discuss why is it so. Uh, we won't go into the details of that. And uh, quickly, if we have to try and compare between coronavirus and influenza virus, the incubation period is much longer for coronavirus, about 14 days, uh, roughly. And it's important to remember that even in the pre-symptomatic phase, individuals could still spread the infection to others. It spreads, uh, uh, there's something called serial interval. This, this interval is longer for coronavirus, which means that it spreads slower, but its infectivity is much higher than for influenza. And while for influenza, children, are important drivers of the virus transmission for corona. It's usually the adult population. So there are some small uh, sort of comparison between corona and influenza. And this slide, we don't need to the, go into the details, only focus on the, top, on the top. And what we want to try and emphasize is the mortality wise, uh, it's much less the novel coronavirus. The mortality is much lower than for the SARS or the MERS virus infections. Of course, the spread is much more with this than we've seen with the others, and it is truly a pandemic that we're seeing. We've already heard about is 2 being the receptor to which the spike protein of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 binds and the TMPRSS2, which helps it to get inside the cell. Now, uh, I brought up this issue of ACE2 because this is important in more ways than one, including in the context of diabetes. So here is uh, the way that the SARS-CoV-2 gets inside the cell, the ACE2 and side by side. Yadav, sorry, sir. Sorry, yeah. sir. AP, AP Jadav, are you in, you are interrupting? You are presenting. Please stop presenting. AP Jadav, AP Jadav, please stop presenting. Doctor AP Jadav, you are requested to stop presenting. Sir, okay, you have to present now. First, again. Sorry, sir. Am I you have okay to go. Now? Uh, you no, have to go to the present now mode again. I am. So, so do I say stop Pre sharing and then? go back no no so you are go to the present now mode but that's but that's not shown now so i have to say stop sharing okay stop sharing first and then go to the present no, now mode stop sharing and again present now yeah okay is it now seen yes is it okay yes yes, yes okay. it's okay okay sir okay, okay. fine fine so uh, 
we know that angiotensin converting enzyme, there is an ACE1, also known as ACE, which converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 has its adverse effects. It causes vasoconstriction. It stimulates the adrenal glands to produce aldosterone, which causes salt and water retention. It can have adverse effects on the heart, kidney, and so on. And so the ACE2, which we remember is the receptor for SARS-CoV-2, but it's a good enzyme also because it helps in breaking down angiotensin 2 into relatively innocuous, inactive products. In addition, it also thought that it may also lead to a protective molecule, angiotensin 1 to 7, which has exactly the opposite effects of angiotensin 2. So is 2 is good for us if we didn't have a lot of SARS-CoV-2 around us. And as the SARS-CoV-2 enters the ACE2, uh, enters through ACE2 into, let us say, the pneumocyte into the lung, it now down-regulates the ACE2, so sort of uh, shuts off uh, and prevents other viruses from getting inside. But in the process, as you decrease ACE2, you also reduce the degradation of angiotensin 2, which otherwise is a harmful molecule. So this virus infection in turn would give rise to a lot of adverse effects because of increased levels of angiotensin 2, because you are now down-regulating the ACE2. And so uh, as you get the infection and as you down-regulate ACE2, you are also sort of uh, making yourself more vulnerable to hypertension, to fibrosis of the heart muscle, to arrhythmias, and to salt and water retention. So that way, ACE2 is important, and we have already learned from Dr. Barshinjit that uh, ACE2 is distributed widely across our body. Probably it spares no organ, and including, importantly, he also mentioned the pancreas, the beta cells of the pancreas also bear this ACE2 receptor. So uh, it's a really a, a bit of a shame that we do not even now know for sure how the virus is transmitted from one individual to the other. The most important is, of course, droplet infection. Uh, these are relatively bigger size droplets, five micron or bigger. They travel short distances. So if you have someone close to you sneezing, coughing, and who is infected, then you can get this infection. But it, those drops also would fall on various surfaces around, could be the floor, could be the table, could be the door knob, door handle, whatever. And then if you touch those spaces, and then that infected hand, if it touches your eyes, your nose, or your mouth, then you could be transmitting the infection there, uh, thereby. The other uh, uh, speculated but increasingly thought to be possible, possible is the airborne infection, meaning that even smaller than five micron droplets, which can travel far and wide and may remain airborne for several hours. So you do not have someone immediately coughing or sneezing in the room, but someone had sneezed in the room and had left the room and then you entered. Through airborne mechanism, it's possible that you may still get infected, but of course, the viral load will be less, and so there's less chance possibly of more severe infection. And this is a, a quick uh, recap of how long the virus can uh, remain alive on different surfaces. So in the air, up to three hours, cardboard boxes, and this and that. However, it must be said that so far, there has not been very well-documented evidence that this virus can be spread from these different surfaces. Theoretically, yes, but uh, realistically, possibly the chances are quite small. Most importantly is droplet infection. Now, the very important question, are people with diabetes more likely to get COVID? The answer for some of you who have got diabetes or many of you who have got relations of friends whom you know to have diabetes, the answer is these individuals who have got diabetes are possibly not more likely to get COVID than the general population. So that's the good news. 
bad news, however, is that if you have got diabetes and you've got COVID-19, then you are at much higher risk of developing the most serious complications and also, unfortunately, at almost a three times higher risk of dying. So 7.3% versus 2.3%. There's one a study that we should soon refer to. And obviously, if you've got multiple comorbidities, means apart from diabetes, if you've got heart disease, if you've got hypertension, if you've got uh, asthma, if you've got an underlying cancer, then of course, the chances of complications and death are more. And this is a slide uh, uh, showing different studies to look at the prevalence of diabetes among patients with COVID. Now, uh, some studies have showed higher prevalence, some have showed not so high prevalence, but overall, the conclusion is uh, there is no higher prevalence just because if uh, 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 an individual has got diabetes. And so this is a meta-analysis of eight studies with almost 50,000 individuals, and which showed the most prevalent comorbidity. Most common was hypertension, then was diabetes, then was heart disease as such, ischemic heart disease, and then respiratory system diseases. And this is the one that I was uh, uh, referring to from 70,000 individuals uh, who had COVID-19. Overall, the mortality rate or case fatality rate was 2.3%. If you were above 70 years, then the rate was 8%. If you had cardiovascular disease, it was almost 11%. And if you had diabetes, it's almost 7.3%. And similarly, if you have got uh, hypertension, if you've got chronic respiratory uh, disease, you've got higher uh, case fatality rate. If you look at it the other way, if you look at survivors versus non-survivors of critically ill COVID-19 patients, clearly amongst the survivors, you have a lower prevalence of diabetes. Amongst non-survivors, you have doubled the prevalence of diabetes. That is, those who did not survive more often had diabetes than those who did survive, right? And so uh, this is another way of, again, looking at diabetes as an important comorbidity, increasing the risk of death by uh, at least 50%. And if you have multiple comorbidities, then the, there is sort of additive effect, uh, maybe slightly complex, not simple additive effect of multiple comorbidities in terms of uh, worsening the prognosis. Now we come to a somewhat busy slide, but try and understand why diabetes is associated with higher uh, risks uh, once you have got COVID-19. We all understand that innate immunity represented by neutrophils, uh, recruitment, uh, interferon, gamma production from NK cells, macrophage activity, all these are affected by the diabetic milieu. milieu. We also understand that ACE2 expression is increased in diabetes, and also it's increased in people with diabetes. Many people with diabetes also are on an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker as treatment for diabetes or for hypertension or as treatment for protection of the kidney or for the heart. And so therefore, there may be increased risk, but as we have said that in reality, this does not seem to be so important. And we have also known that uh, once COVID-19 enters a cell, it degrades and downregulates the ACE2 in several tissues. And so there is increased, uh, uh, relative increased activity of ACE1, and therefore increased availability of angiotensin II, and therefore more inflammation across the body. And also diabetes as such, we know, is a condition of a relatively low grade of inflammation going on. And in the face of an infection, there is some sort of dysregulation of the immune response so that possibly the early inflammatory response is less. And we know this inflammatory response also helps to keep the infection under check. So that does not happen. But there is later 
a dysregulated hyperimmune response giving rise to the so-called cytokine storm. So there are ways uh, which we partly understand, I must admit, not fully understand why a diabetes is more likely to develop the more serious, severe consequences of this infection. However, the good news is that if you have the glucose levels well controlled, then much of this higher risk of serious illness can be reduced, brought down to the baseline level. However, it's to be remembered that part of the higher risk in diabetes is also because diabetes, uh, someone with diabetes uh, longstanding could also have underlying organ dysfunction. It could be the kidneys which are affected, it could be the heart which are affected, the two most important organs. And so even if the glucoses are well controlled, if you have already compromised function of these organs, then also the results could be not so good. And so uh, what are the challenges for diabetes management for someone uh, who is at home uh, during the pandemic? the patient uh, may or may not have had a COVID infection, but already everyone is under stress. So mental stress is very important, especially the diabetic, because now they have heard that if you get a COVID, your chances of getting more serious uh, complications are more. Then uh, but during the prolonged period of lockdown, exercise outside, outdoors was uh, negligible. And even now people are afraid to go out and exercise freely. And then there was a lot of time spent indoors, no work outdoors, work from home. And so uh, what do you do? You eat again and again. And so all these factors, uh, and then on top of that, uh, uh, physician visits were less, going to the lab to get their tests is less, people are afraid to go out. And so all of these uh, would lead to problems in management of diabetes. In hospital, someone who's got diabetes and is admitted in hospital, maybe for uh, COVID, uh, again, the stress factor builds even higher. It leads to more release of inflammatory cytokines, more endogenous release of glucocorticoids. And also, uh, there is the disease process itself, uh, an infection, which also leads to inflammatory cytokines. And then you use glucocorticoids from outside as a treatment for COVID to control the inflammation. And all of these could make the glucose levels go much higher than it was before hospitalization. So, and on top of that, it could be unstable glucose control because the patient may be ill and not able to take all the food. So sometimes the glucose may be going too low, sometimes going too high. So it's very important that glucose be properly monitored even in hospital. There are people who have got type 1 diabetes where insulin is not at all produced in the body. The numbers are much smaller than the most common type 2 diabetes. The risks are similar, but type 1 diabetes has added risk of developing a severe form of worsening of the uh, hyperglycemic state known as diabetic ketoacidosis, as in any systemic stress conditions, and COVID-19 could be one such. So the glucose management strategies uh, would differ. Of course, this is not a medical uh, sort of doctor's audience. So we need not go into the details, but if you have mild to moderate glucose increase and the COVID uh, infection is mild, then one may continue the usual tablets that someone was controlled on. But if there is more severe manifestations if this individual is also being treated with steroids, glucocorticoids, then insulin is what should be used. Uh, amongst the different drugs, uh, medicines used for treatment of diabetes type 2, metformin is sort of the first line. And there was actually a small study in China, which suggested that uh, the mortality was actually lower in those who were on metformin versus those who were not, but it was a relatively small study. And so one cannot make a strong recommendation, but whoever has been well controlled on metformin should have the drug continued even in hospital. However, there is a significant contraindication to the use of metformin in patients who are 
significantly hypoxic because uh, if the oxygen levels are not enough in the blood, then there are uh, serious side effects of use of metformin. So of course, if the patient is relatively stable at home, continue metformin in hospital, even if it's, uh, relatively stable, you may continue. But beyond a certain point, if the patient needs oxygen to be given from outside, then metformin should be discontinued. Now then, uh, there's a lot of talk about hydroxychloroquine in COVID-19. Now, this was first developed in our country for treatment of malaria. Then it was recognized as having important anti-inflammatory action. And it's now used worldwide for this use for various rheumatic sort of condition as a disease modifying agent. But over the last five years or so, it's also now accepted as a drug to treat type 2 diabetes, to treat high, high glucose levels in our country at least. So in a way, it, it's an important molecule uh, to be considered. And also from in vitro data, from in vitro studies, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. Just a minute, sir. Sorry, sorry, to, yes. sorry to interrupt you, sir. Someone yeah. again uh, presenting that. AP, Dr. AP Jada, please stop presenting. Dr. AP Jada, please stop presenting. Dr. AP Jadab, you are requested to stop presenting. Dr. AP Jadab, please. You are always disturbing the session. Please don't do this. Sir, sir, please, will, will you go to the present now mode again? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now no, it's there. So, so, uh, so it's, it has been used world over initially for both treatment and prophylaxis of COVID-19 infection. But over uh, the course of time, as one got better data, it uh, came to be controversial. And uh, uh, in fact, in the middle of June, uh, World Health Organization, which was carrying out a large study to look at different possible uh, treatment modalities, stopped the hydroxychloroquine arm because various other studies showed that uh, not only did it fail to show improvement, sometimes it was associated with higher mortality. However, in our country, ICMR, Indian Council for Medical Research, uh, still uh, sort of uh, uh, professes, suggests that it be used in a preventive role uh, for healthcare workers, for paramilitary, or police personnel, or surveillance staff, uh, frontline staff on surveillance duty in containment zones, uh, suggesting that the doses that they're using are lower and the population that are being used on are generally more healthier, not the elderly sick people. So we cannot directly extrapolate the results of studies in sick people to these relatively healthy individuals. And they have got some data to suggest that uh, there was uh, some protection from the development of this infection. Now, now we come to uh, steroid. Dexamethasone is a steroid glucocorticoid. It has been found uh, to have important role when used appropriately for short duration in the course of COVID-19 to block, to treat, to mitigate the inflammatory response. And the good thing is it's relatively cheap and could be affordable for uh, practically all groups of people even in our country. And so our government also has approved the use of dexamethasone. But we also do remember that it comes with a whole host of side effects. For, though for short periods of use, many of those will not be relevant, but we do remember it's likely to increase the glucose blood glucose levels. We come to this very important issue of the use of ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, which we mentioned is being used by many individuals, including especially those who've got diabetes and with great benefits. But the concern that has been raised, and initially there was a scare, a panic, and people had stopped using the ACE uh, or ARB uh, because uh, these drugs are associated with increase in the level of ACE2 and therefore would suggest that this would increase the risk of COVID-19 infection. However, subsequent studies have shown that it is not associated with any harm. Actually, those who have been continuing ACE or ARB should continue to get the benefits for which they had been start, started on this medication. So information for people with diabetes and COVID, 
well most important is should not stop your medication should monitor the glucose much more regularly at home using your glucometer because uh, uh, many people are still afraid to step out to go to the labs to get the test and so monitoring at home is the sole or the most important mode of monitoring that they can do and that should continue and keeping in contact with the physician maintaining physical exercise even at home in whatever form and maintaining a healthy diet remember take plenty of vegetables citrus fruits all of which can help possibly in warding off uh, covid-19 and also the standard uh, precautions that anyone else should take people with diabetes should be even more careful to prevent uh, 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 this infection affecting them similarly if you have uh, any flu like illness uh, we should make sure that you are adequately hydrated meaning take enough fluids monitor your glucose even more closely monitor your temperature and make sure that your glucose levels are controlled and adjust the doses of various drugs in consultation with your physician similarly the general precautionary measures uh, like hand washing and avoiding close contact with anyone uh, are to be uh, followed even more so for people with diabetes and then about the wearing of masks now possibly uh, wearing of masks is indicated practically for everyone once you are in a public space and that is also uh, advised by our government uh, the ministry of health and family welfare uh, guidelines for the use of mask we do not want to uh, go into but we do understand that the different types of mask available the cloth mask and we have now got various designer cloth masks available they are rel relatively loose fitting now these are uh, important for individuals who have got an infection for preventing the spread of infection but in order to protect yourself from getting infected from others this is uh, uh, less important more important would be a surgical mask but even better would be an n95 mask now finally before we uh, wind off uh, we do remember again dr majumdar had referred to this that because uh, ace2 receptors are present on beta cells of the pancreas even they can be affected it was well demonstrated in the sars infection earlier on but even now with the sars cov2 there is possibility of new development of diabetes not only that does diabetes had an adverse effect on covid-19 prognosis but covid-19 itself could give rise to new onset of diabetes so blood blood glucose check is must for everyone who is admitted with covid-19 and also we do understand that uh, those who have got diabetes may have worsening of the glucose control during this infection so finally uh, uh, the message is well uh, those with diabetes do not have increased risk of the infection but if they have this infection they have much higher risk of developing complications and also of dying if the glucose is well controlled the risk of this serious uh, illness could be decreased somewhat and one has to make sure that there is enough fluids enough glucose control enough monitoring and with these i think most people will sail through this uh, quite well because we do talk of high mortality but even that uh, you remember that more than 90% will come out well after this infection so thank you very much once again for providing me this opportunity if there is any time i would like uh, i would be happy to answer any questions thank you very much sir it's a nice pleasure for your presenter to hear the presentation if i am requesting the participants if you have any question you can go through the question directly by your putting your audio on if all the participants are requested that if you have any question you can put your video a uh, audio on and ask the question directly right maybe is there any question participants you were requested
find that so okay uh, i think there is no such question everyone is right. is flooded yeah. the feedback form and all these things okay. yeah 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 there is a there is a question sir uh, why uh, are diabetic okay. patients not likely to get covid 19 it's not that uh, they are not likely I, to get i i think it's a reverse question this is not the true thing actually yeah, they are yeah. much more uh, comorbid yeah, situation I, yeah as i said that it, it's not they are not likely but they are possibly as likely as anyone else but uh, this may be the nth time that i want to repeat that but if they get it they are more likely to develop the complications the, the more serious complications of this uh, illness thank you sir excuse me uh, sir i have a question yeah. yeah can i ask sir yeah you can ask you can if you have okay. the time yeah is there, is there any out. is there any study going on in our country to maintain a database of diabetic patient to see the effect of covid 19 on diabetic patients uh well we have tried it but i don't think we have a uh, very good database being maintained in our country at this point of time no the answer so is uh, is there no, any not, plan not, to not mind yeah is yeah, there yeah. any plan yes 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 absolutely there is a plan yes so there is another question yes sir thank you sir blood in sorry there is a question another question is there so do the blood thinners uh -huh. do blood thinners have negative effect on covid yeah. patients I, uh, not really actually uh, this just the opposite one of the uh, serious as as a complication of this cytokine storm or the hyperinflammatory response there is widespread damage to the vascular endothelium and widespread uh, clotting in the blood blood vessels especially in the lungs and so uh, as part of the treatment now uh, blood thinners uh put or by mouth maybe something like as simple as aspirin or an anticoagulant injections like the heparin analogs in oxyparin or something like that are now being provided as routine treatment to prevent those uh, dangerous consequences of this infection so it's it's not harmful it's possibly beneficial thank you thank you so much doctor thank you thank you hello the yes hello yeah uh, yes yeah. i am yeah, I'm not audible yeah 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 go through so, so, uh, uh, dr choudhury as you are a renowned endocrinologist and this is a very much informative session i would like to just ask one question about uh, not about directly about diabetes but is there any possibility that a person with a very prolonged hypothyroidism is very much uh, i mean uh, Uh, I mean, predisposed or predisposed to COVID nineteen like this? Is there any? Uh, right. I I don't think we have uh, any definite evidence uh, to that regard, but okay. uh, because hypothyroidism is generally easily treated, so you may have been having the disease for a long time, but if you are being adequately treated for it, mm -hmm. so by which means currently on treatment, your mm -hmm. thyroid uh, reports are normal. then definitely you do not have any higher risk but if you are untreated and for a long period of time what happens uh, we do not have our scientific evidence to answer your question okay okay thank you thank you very much doctor so is there any other question from the participants otherwise our next speaker is waiting with us in this meeting so we'll go to that part the next thank part for me thank you very much now thank you very uh, much uh, sir welcome so how do i i hope i have come out of the present now no so i have to come so out of it so you are not presenting anything sir there is no problem yeah okay so there yeah. is no problem okay good yeah right so now the, our next speaker is dr professor dhrubajyoti chattopadhyay it is an honor for me to introduce such a versatile person like dj c sir yes i never call him by his name and he has an immense experience in teaching postgraduate courses for 35 long years 
and supervising 30 PhD students. He is presently the Vice Chancellor of Sister Nivedita University and he is the former Vice Chancellor of Amity University, Kolkata. He is the former Professor, Department of Biochemistry and Biotechnology, University of Calcutta. He is a former Pro Vice Chancellor Academy of Calcutta University. He is involved in initiating new courses like postgraduate postgraduate program in microbiology, genetics, environmental science, and biotechnology, and contributing in a major way towards teaching, research, and development of university infrastructure. He demonstrated skills in network projects with other university and institutes. He is a visiting scientist in Cleveland Clinic Foundation, University of Texas, University of California, San Diego, University of Connecticut, Nihon University, Japan, State University of New York, USA, Okayama University, Japan. He is the ex-president of West Bengal Academy of Science and Technology and Society of Biological Chemists in India. Fellow, he is a fellow of National Academy of Science, West Bengal Academy of Science and Technology, and the Indian Academy of Science. His recent focus, his uh, research focus is on regulation of gene expression of negative standard RNA virus, the structure function studies of different regulatory proteins, oxidative damage of different macromolecules in the cell, and its mechanism. Enzyme biotechnology, cell migration and signaling, nanobiotechnology. He has the 125 publications in peer-reviewed international journals and five review articles and six book chapters. He has two patents in his credentials. So today we will hear from such a brilliant scientist, extraordinary academician and enormously efficient administrator. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, let me first congratulate the college and also uh, the vice chancellor under which this particular college is associated with State University, uh, West Bengal State University. I must thank Bashok Choudhury, Professor Bashok Choudhury, the principal, and all the faculty members of the Department of Microbiology from the college, and also all the participants who are uh, till now waiting for this. Uh, for my seminar. Uh, it is indeed a great pleasure for me to actually hear just now to uh, a person who is actually treating my diabetes for the last 12 and because of him I could keep it in my control. So thank you Professor Choudhury for giving me all the directives to how to proceed and uh, your presentation actually has got so many different aspects of understanding. It's very nice. Borshundit also almost like my student and uh, almost every uh, time he is writing anything I used to get it and it is so nicely expressed by him about the total COVID thing uh, and documented by him. Actually, I, many of the presentations I have done in so many webinars, I used <laughs> Borshundit's uh, information as one of my resources. Now today, uh, you know that uh, I just want to uh, try to move out from the regulars because almost everything has been discussed. So uh, what are the new dimensions in understanding SARS-CoV-2? I don't want to go through the regular processes. I don't want to actually, I want to focus. I have to mention a little bit, but I want to focus on a completely new thing, which is very, uh, when I used to work with an RNA virus called Chandipura virus, I actually did the phosphogenome analysis phosphoproteome analysis and over here uh, when the phosphoproteome analysis is coming up in case of this infection also which is also an RNA virus I really felt uh, very much interested. May I request the organizers to uh, present my slides please? Yes, yes sir. Yeah, so um, uh, I shall go through the slides right now and um,
is it okay sir uh yeah can i have the first slide please yeah 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 uh, yeah, yeah. these are opening slides sir so new dimensions in understanding sars cov2 yeah. so the next slide i just want to mention three things the discovery of corona virus in this discovery of corona virus i find that the most important thing that in 1901 to 1928 the first human virus which has been discovered is the yellow fever virus and that particular thing has been moved on in 1937 the discovery of the first corona virus avian infection bronchitis virus avian infectious bronchitis virus in 1937 which has been later on proved to be a corona virus and the discovery of first human human corona virus there is always a question mark there is a strain b814 in 1961 the strain is currently lost uh, so these are the background how the virus diseases been identified to the corona virus corona virus to the first human corona virus next slide so the in uh, documented one uh, um, dorothy ham actually she actually identified this particular virus uh and uh, we could find out that uh, infectious disease researcher at the university of chicago department of medicine in 1966 and june almeda uh, who is working in britain's common cold research unit in salisbury uh, produced a first electron micrographic image of this virus you can see the electron micrographic image where from people used to know about this corona the spikes which are coming out of this and there are seven human corona virus species uh, which are actually uh, exist today now we have a different types also now if you look at this virus i am sure everybody already mentioned about it uh, and it belongs to the beta corona virus group but the spike proteins which you can see these are having a heavy n terminal glycosylation this is one of the most important thing what we could find this glycosylation of the spike proteins and there are other proteins having different types of activities and uh, it it's actually found to be the e protein which has an ion channel activity and one of the most important reason for its virulence um now if you look at the timeline next slide next slide yeah uh this is a timeline of the emergence of the human corona virus and i mentioned to you that if you go through it then after this 229e which drivers uh, which actually diverged and then we can see that the human corona virus hku1 in 1950s in 2000 we had seen the sars cov1 which is a first well studied one and the closest to the sars bat this bat corona virus and it was there for 4 to 17 years before this sars epidemic that means 2002 is uh, uh, its epidemic came out but there is another one mars covid which was found in the human camel interface and there are neuro neuron mix and this beta corona virus and treated back to 2006 and over here uh, the most important thing what has been found that this sars cov1 and the sars cov2 and we call this sars cov2 as one of the most recent um, uh, identified virus particle and this sars cov uh, in both the cases ac2 is a receptor but in case of the n protein is a interferon gamma inhibitor but in case of the sars cov2 it's not known the r0 value for search cov2 is very high 1.4 to 2.5 and uh, you know that um, the uh, there is gla ground glass opacities lumbar consolidation which we found in cov1 infection uh, it was found that no nodular opacities are there and this uh, the same thing hand hygiene droplets are the one which carries this virus and contact with infected individuals with asymptomatic ones and fatality rate for covid 1 is much much higher than that of covid 2 which is 2.3%
And it was found that if you look at this particular, next slide please, this uh, uh, whole features of this infection, which have been stage one, stage two, stage three, the early infection, pulmonary phase infection, and the hyperinflammation phase. So at the early stage, the viral response phase, once the virus enters in our body, to the stage two, the pulmonary phase, when the host inflammatory response starts, that's why you call it pulmonary phase, and then the hyperinflammation phase, which has been discussed by the previous uh, speakers also. In these particular cases, there are different types of signs are available from the viral response phase. When the lympho, uh, I could see the lymphopenia, increased prothrombin time, increase the D dimer and LDH, but the abnormal chest imaging starts from the stage two, and you can see the low normal. Uh, uh, things in this particular case and this ARDS, these acute respiratory syndromes are actually uh, associated with cardiac failures is taking place in the hyperinflammatory phase where the elevated inflammatory markers like CRP, LDH, IL-6, D-dermer, ferritin, troponin, all things are actually being uh, elevated and used as a biomarkers. Now, this is actually the one which I just wanted to just mention to you over here, uh, because uh, over here I could see that in general, the things which are uh, coming out that after infection, the type 2 cells release the signals that recruit the macrophages. The macrophages release the cytokines for the vasodilation, which allows more fluid comes to the site of injury, fluid accumulation starts the alveoli, the fluid dilutes the surfactant, uh, and which are the onset of the alveolar collapse. The neutrophils are then recruited, we heard from Professor uh, Choudhury also, and the type 1, type 2 cells are destroyed, leading to collapse of the alveoli and causing the respiratory distress syndrome in the third phase and thereby we can get the surge that the systematic inflammatory response syndrome if inflammation becomes severe. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, next. So this part I have just explained and then you can see that what is going on over there here and thereby what we can go for the whole thing. So in general what we can see that the life cycle of the core, next slide life cycle of the SARS-CoV virus. I don't want to spend much more time over here. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. So um, uh, over here, I could actually just wanted to demonstrate that the SARS-CoV-2 infection can spread faster. Now, why it spread faster? The spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, it is actually the uh, most important thing to be considered and um, it carries an activation sequence of the so-called S1, S2 cleavage site, which is similar to those observed in highly pathogenic human avian influenza, but which has so far not been found in viruses closely related with COVID-2. And this S1, S2 fusion site uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 spike is cleaved by the cellular protease furin, and that this cleavage event is essential for the infection of lung cells. It is also important for the fusion of infected cells with non-infected cells, which might allow the virus to spread in the body without leaving the host cell. So you can see the furin, and the second one is a TMPRS22. And over here, you can see that this SARS-CoV-2 infection can spread faster First, it's already infected cells. The enzyme furin cuts the spike protein. The spike protein then mediates viral attachment to a new host cell. In order to efficiently enter the cell, the spike protein still needs to be activated by the enzyme PRSS2. Next slide. Next slide. So this, no, just the slide before. Yes. So this particular activation of TMPRSS2 is only possible if the spike protein has previously been cleaved by furin. So these two proteins are very important. So any way if the furin or this TMPRSS2 can be actually blocked, it will not allow. 
So fibrin is present in various human organs, liver, lung, small intestine. And the fact that the enzyme resides in all these human tissues means that the virus can potentially attack the several organs at once. Next slide. This is actually the chronology of events during the SARS-CoV-2 infection. I shall not go through already. Barshunjit actually discussed about it. Uh, the only thing is that this, um, the one actually mentioned also by Professor Chakraborty, that the neighboring epithelial cells and the endothelial cells and alveolar macrophages triggers the generation of pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, including the IL-6, IP-10, macrophage inflammatory protein, MIP1 beta, MIP, MCP1. These proteins attract the monocytes, macrophages and T cells to the site of infection, promoting further inflammation. And with the addition of interferon gamma, gamma produced by T cells and establishing a pro-inflammatory feedback loop. And that's why what we could see that these particular things are going to be very, very important with respect to the infection process. Next slide. In this chronology of the events, you can see in these slides, I just wanted to men mention about the immune response. The defective immune response, this may lead to the further accumulation of immune cells in the lungs, causing overproduction of pro-inflammatory cytokines and these damages the lung infrastructure. The resulting cytokine storm is the one in the third phase which is actually dangerous and is the cause of the death of this. So in the, generally we can say that in a healthy immune response the initial inflammation attracts virus specific T cells to the site of infection where they can eliminate the infected cells before the virus spreads. Now, neutralizing antibodies in these individuals can block the viral infection and alveolar macrophages. It recognizes and neutralizes viruses and apoptotic cells and clear them by phagocytosis. Altogether, this process led to clearance of the virus and minimal lung damage resulting in recovery. Now, if this happens before a certain level, the patient remains asymptomatic, but the patient goes to the clinical stage two, that is the pulmonary stage, they started the symptoms and other things also, but the, the, there are asymptomatic patients which may have the different levels of viral load depending on their immune system and many other things. Now, if you look at the potential therapeutic against SARS-CoV-2, there are a lot of things that people are right now claiming. Uh, Pro-inflammatory cytokines by using the mechanical filtration, we can have the uh, protease inhibitors or we can have the virus specific effector CD8 plus T cells resulting from vaccination. So all these things are being added, but to me, we have to come out with some antiviral molecules, and which is very important what we could study during all the different types of viral infection. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, next slide. Yeah, so the complement activation may also contribute to the maladaptive inflammatory response seen in some patients with severe COVID-19 inhibition of C3 or C5 may have therapeutic potential. So these are actually, if you go through this therapeutic potential. Next slide. Now, the potential outcomes of the antibody responses to coronaviruses, the neutralizing antibody or the, you can see that there are the different types of, this is actually what we are looking for when we're talking about the vaccines or how we are going to have the protein-based vaccines also to get into this. And uh, there are a lot of things are going on and I just don't want to go through it because there are uh, some part has already been discussed. Next slide. Uh, this is the picture demonstrating the pathological inflammation in patients with COVID-19 and how the, so far what I have discussed 
that these are the major states what we can see but you can see the activation of jack step pathways activation of tlr7 and there are cytokine storm by the il6 tnf il8 il10 6 cell 10 the il ira tra and everything which are actually responsible for the ultimate the from the oxidative stress part to the cytokine storm so this is actually what we call as a pathological inflammation in patients now hyperactivated monocytes to coagulation in covid 19 uh, somebody is uh, asking earlier that the thin, thin blood thinners and other things now the circulating pro inflammatory stimuli such as viral pathogen associated molecular patterns damage associated molecular patterns and cytokines triggers this activation of blood monocytes which respond by including tissue factor membrane expression now when the endothelial cells are activated by the cytokines and viral particles addition molecules then actually the things happen now, if you look at that, how the neutrophils are recruited by the activated endothelial cells and release neutrophil extracellular traps, which you call as a nets, which activate the coagulation contact pathway and bind and activate the platelets to amplify blood clotting. So this is actually reason why we can see blood thinners sometimes helping the patients also. Major endogenous anticoagulant pathways, which includes tissue factor pathway inhibitor, TFP1, antithrombin, and protein C, are reduced further, support, supporting the coagulation in activation. Now, one thing is very interesting to find out, I just want to share with all my dear friends present over here, that it's COVID-19 information WHO uh, started uh, in the month of early January from December China and then in this couple of months you can see there is rapidly emerging data and leading to the advanced understanding of how SARS-CoV-2 takes over host cell. On March 11, COVID-2 has been identified by um, this um, uh, WHO causing the pandemic. Now, during this period, just in this last six months, we have seen there are almost 9,962 journal articles on SARS-CoV-2. Just on SARS-CoV-2, 10,000 articles. There are a lot of articles what we could find. They have some contradictory views also. But in the meantime, already there are 22 retractions and there are three temporary retractions. So out of 10,000, already 25 was found not to be in a good state, but the rest of the things have different types of opinions, which are actually uh, is making us a little bit difficult in understanding of the whole thing. Now, the one I wanted to discuss with you today is from a journal pre-proof, uh, which is coming, uh, going to come out in cell. This is regarding this phosphoproteomics. Now, the search COVID-2 infection reports and the phosphoproteomic analysis when are being plotted, it was found by simulation activities that what it should look like. You can see the phosphoproteomics planning of the cells, response of the cells. And this data is actually coming out for a very uh, sophisticated uh, LCMS and a highly integrated circular circuit. Now, uh, when these kinase activities are actually looked upon from the evolutionary basis, it is found that the pathway regulation has been done by the PK3CA, the AKT, the PKFVYV, and then we can have the CDK a alpha CK2. This CK2 is a casein kinase 2. This casein kinase 2 is also found in the virus I am studying, which plays a very important role in the viral activation process. And the pathway regulation is controlled by the MAP kinase P38 and these other um, things which are coming up. Now, you know that the philopodial penetration of the whole thing with the CK2 
and the pharmacological inhibitor testing has been shown in the graph, which is very interesting to find out. If you look at the virus versus the cell viability, you can see the dose, the cell viability, it will remain constant, comes down, and then remains constant. But if you look at the virus percentage, you could see it's going down uh, higher than 0 0.01 micromolar. This particular pharmacological inhibitor is tested is uh, controlling this virus uh, assembly process, virus activation process. So, the global proteomics of phosphorylation and abundance changes upon SARS-CoV-2 infection had been studied basically where the Vero E6 cells were infected with SARS-CoV-2. After one hour of viral uptake, cells are harvested and subsequently after a different time period. As a control, the Vero E6 cells were also mock infected for one hour. So mock infected one and the SARS-CoV-2 infected one and then the mock time course has been plotted and you can see the infected time course also and thereby you can see the protein abundance so biological triplets per point has been done by the authors the protein abundance and also the phosphorylation the the mass spectrograph analysis the dmi mass spectrograph analysis the orthologue alignment has been done and you can see that in this global proteomics of phosphorylation and abundant changes upon SARS-CoV-2 infection, number of significantly regulated phosphorylation side groups across the infection time course in the first graph. And in the second graph, about the abundance of the proteins, number of significantly regulated proteins across the infection time course. And you can see within 24 hours, well, what's a huge amount of these particular things are coming treatment analysis of all significantly changing proteins in terms of abundance divided into two sets down regulated which are the blue one and the up regulated which are the red one and in this way you can see that geo enrichments are found that the down regulated are the platelet degranulation collagen containing extracellular matrix platelet dense granule lumen hyaluronan and metabolic process Whereas the RNA polymerase hollow enzyme, it actually gets upregulated. But on the other hand, there are a lot of translation factors was found to be inactivated. So this is the one which actually gives us the SARS-CoV-2 viral protein phosphor. Here I mentioned about the M protein, N protein, NEP protein, NSP, NSP 14, NSP 3, NSP 9. These are non-structural proteins, 14, 3, 9, the old 19B, and the S protein. So if you look at the S protein, the spike protein also, there are several points, the localization of phosphorylation sites across the viral protein sequences. The stem height indicates the predicted deleteriousness of alanine substitution. So if these phosphorylation sites are substituted by alanine, what is going to happen? That has been shown. So in that way, this is uh, actually, this is a map that the, how the protein phosphorylation sites on the different proteins on this, and they are getting up and down in the uh, course of virus infection. Now, when the phosphorylation sites are actually looked upon, it was found the distribution of the secondary structure elements in which the viral phosphorylation sites were found as classified by DSSP uh, programming, the beta ton is 16.7%, beta strand is 11.1%, bending is 11.1%. But the loop or irregular are the 61.1%. The loop irregular is one. And over here you can see the secret has the highest number, best match of number of SARS CoV 2 phosphorylation sites. So top matching host kinase to viral phosphoprotein sites according to the net forest program, the CK2, the TGF beta, CLK, CDK, PKC, RCK, P38, DMPK, PKA, CK1, GR, PDGFR, DAPK, ATM, TLK, MSN, PKB. 
if you look at this particular things all these kinases play very important cell regulatory role and signaling process so all these things are actually has got the potential phosphorylation sites and the sars cov2 viral phosphorylation sites when the structure of the phosphorylation uh, cluster in the n terminal tail of the m protein actually been shown by the red residues you can see that m protein which is being phosphorylated and on the other side you, you can see that surface electrostatic potential of rna binding domain of the n protein the surface electrostatic potential the non phosphorylated versus a phosphorylated n you can see the minor structural change and the s105 plays a very very important role whereas the thiamine 16 thi uh, thionine 166 remains almost same so the basic palm like structure when looked at and the acidic rich uh, are being looked at it was found the serine 105 plays a very important role so position of phosphorylation sites indicated with arrows the blue denotes the positive charge potential red indicates the negative charge potential and you can see the differences the, how the negative charge potential being changed in the phosphorylated n and this is actually how we can get the virus host protein protein interaction map this is actually what we call as a systems biology development knowledge and in the systems biology development knowledge it was found that 332 human proteins they are interacting with 27 viral proteins so 27 viral proteins interacted with the 332 human proteins and 40 out of these 332 were found to be significantly differentially phosphorylated across at least two time points and i shall not go through this but if you look at this uh, uh, photograph you can see the SARS CoV 2, which has been marked by the red um, diamond structure, the human protein as a gray one, and you can see that how this physical interaction is taking place, and that's all the different things which are coming out. And this particular information gives us a very important virus interaction map, is helping us to get an understanding of the signaling changes in host cells in response to the SARS-CoV-2 infection. Now we look at the clusters of significantly changing phosphorylation sites across the time course of infection with non-redundant enriched reactum pathway, it terms shown for each cluster. The horizontal red lines below each pathway term correspond to phosphorylated proteins belonging to the pathway and the black bordered rectangle is indicating of a significantly enriched term so this is how actually we can look at the whole thing and you can see that different things the hiv infection also can how it changes the cell cycle to the dna replication to the apoptosis all of these are actually mapped together now in these particular cases the signaling changes in host cells in response to source covid to infection which are going to help the systems biology approach the kinase is depicting the strong change in activity of an infection. So once this particular protein gets phosphorylated, it actually do a lot of different things in the uh, during the infection. And the schematic representation of the interaction between host kinase and the SARS-CoV-2 viral proteins have been shown in this uh, picture where you can see the large numbers, the SARS-CoV-2 protein, how they're interacting with the physically interacting with human kinases as well as it will show the human phosphorylation sites. Now this signaling changes in response to SARS-CoV-2 can also be looked upon as a correlation of kinase activity. Next slide. Correlation of kinase activity profiles of each time point with other biological conditions. So if we can actually, this is actually known as a Pearson correlation. Uh, so in the bio, bioinformatics studies, we used to do that. And that itself gives an idea about the kinase activity profiles. Now, the overall phosphorylation change of a protein complex 
can be looked upon. If you look at the different, very interesting protein from the spliceosomes to the HCF to the MLL2 to the pervulin to SMART, all these particular things, and this is a level of complex phosphorylation has been shown also in the site, and you can see that how it's being distributed. So this is actually the overall phosphorylation change of a protein complex. Now, when we look at this overall phosphorylation change, the regulated phosphorylation sites and surge COVID-2 interaction partners involved in cytoskeletal interaction. In my last lecture, in, uh, I think it's in the Jain College, I mentioned about the cytoskeletal reorganization. That's in 1st of July. But the answers are not available to me at that time. Then I looked at the cytoskeletal reorganizations are actually regulated phosphorylation sites, interaction partners are being identified also. So if you look at the uh, row and the rock signaling with the kinase activity, you can see the rock one, that's STMN, on S25, the VIM S39, or the VAV S56. So more or less all, all over, you can see the serine phosphorylation plays very important role. And in case of the casein kinase 2 signaling, you can see the CD, NNA, the HDA, then HNGA, the my h 9 s so all this row 9 with the NSP7 in the CSKN2B, CSKN2A2 and the CK2 with the N, you can see the two groups and that actually ultimately giving rise to STMN1, VIA, HDAC, MGA1, all these are actually which helps in the cytoskeletal reorganization. And I, it's amazing that in such a short time, it is possible to identify the different kinase of activities which are actually responsible for the cytoskeletal reorganization. It's only for the very strong um, uh, support from the bioinformatics system. So this biocompetition is helping in a very big way in actually predicting a lot of things. Now, when we looked at the co-localization of this cytokine, uh, this casein kinase 2, and the viral proteins as actin protrusions, it was found the M protein localization along and to the tip of phylopodia, the tip of the phylopodia you can see. Then we can see the co-localization between the uh, casein kinase 2 and N protein throughout infected cells in the CACO2 cells. The surge COVID-2 budding from the very E6 cell, phylopodia, this one actually been represented in the other, and the, in the team you can see how it's absolutely looking at the surge COVID-2 is coming out of the very E6 cell, phylopodia, and that's how the cytoskeletal regulation takes place, and you can see that how the tip of phylopodia plays an important role. And this is the first time it's been demonstrated, this one. The surge COVID-2 activates the P38 MAP kinase signaling pathway also. And here also we can see the inflammatory cytokines, LPS, UV, stress, everything is actually helping the MAP kinase uh, uh, 2K. And that itself goes to P38, the other substrates and the STAT1, the, the MAP kinase, um, uh, you can see that ultimately it goes to the HSPB1. NELFE, ATF1, CREB, and the CREB responsive expressions actually causes this IL2, IL6, IL10 uh, to give this whole cycle inflammatory cytokines production. So this is how the cytokine storm can take place. On the other hand, if you look at the SARS-CoV-2, activates a P38 MAP kinase activity, that's one I mentioned to you. The kinase activity analysis has been shown in this picture, and the hours post infection, and the Western blot analysis of phosphorylated P38 MAP kinase signaling compounds in the mock and the cells can be shown very clearly about the differences. And this has actually been shown in this slide, which is over here, that uh, activates this thing. How actually you can see the four change profiles of indicated the P38 MAP kinase substance during the SARS CoV 2 infection. Now, in the transcription factor activity of SARS CoV 2, infected A549 or Cali 3 and NHB cells compared to the P38 MAP kinase transcription factors to transcription factors not associated with the P32 MAP kinase pathway, that has been shown over here. 
and in general the arctic upcr analysis indicate that the mis uh, mrna from the ac2 a549 cells pretreated with p38 inhibitor at indicated concentration for one hour prior to infection with sars cov2 for 24 hours and you can see a drastic effect on this and this is very uh, uh, very re relevant with respect to how it looks like now the sars cov2 also causes cell cycle errors the heat map of the pearson's correlation uh, coefficients comparing the sars cov2 infected vero e6 phosphorylation profiles to profile of cells with induced dna damage and cells arrested at indicated cell cycle stages shown that at the different stages mitosis sg2 l let s early s u1 s g1 how actually affects it and you can see the four change profiles of the indicated cell cycle and dna damage substrates during the sars cov2 analysis now the dna content analysis of cells infected with sars cov2 for 24 hours compared to the mock infected cells has been shown in this particular figure on your right hand side and you can see uh, that how actually this particular at different phases z0 z1 s and the z2m you can see the differences between the mock and the infected cells and you can see difference in these two uh, cases the mapping the regulated kinase to kinase inhibitors identified the sars cov2 therapies so why it is so important right now because as i mentioned other than the vaccines another pathway is uh, uh, trying to get some antiviral molecules and uh, which are specific to this virus and not to the host cell and this mapping of the regulated kinase to the kinase inhibitors which are not going to have any side effect on the host cells the, uh, for developing this therapies was done in this way you can see there is a large amount of work is going on and from here people can actually start predicting about the different types of uh, kinase inhibitors which could be uh, which can act be considered for the therapies and it, it was found that if you look at the similar test this actually uh, acts on the cs and k2a2 and the cs and k2b and the physical interaction with the end protein goes down and you can see the dose with curve with the virus one and the virus anti-NP and the cell viability has been shown over here and here you can see it has got some sort of effect on the cell viability so people are looking for much more better compounds and to find out that what sort of kinase inhibitors will be much more active now, when looking at this mapping regulated kinase, there are several other inhibitors are also being used. And you can see in all these particular cases, this relimentive dose is a one, where you can see the, the uh, cell viability. Or in case of, if you look at the, uh, by the virus Arctic uh, QPCR assay, uh, the cell viability, you can see the dose is actually with this one is going to be very less whereas when we looked at this it is very obvious that in this way we can come out with more and more molecules which will have a better effect so people are always trying the less effect on the cell viability more effect on the virus itself with all these type of proteins and this mapping this regulated kinase to kinase inhibitors it identifies as i mentioned to you with the therapies so these are the different molecules identified so far and you can see some molecules are very very important with respect to say amylipone you can see the amylipone dose has got a very little effect at the 0.01 on the cell viability but maximum effect on the virus similarly if you look at the dianacin it is not a good one so in that way, all these things are going to. So we are hoping that this work is going to revolutionize and help us in identifying the uh, antiviral uh, molecules in a much better way. And I am really interested that till that day, we have to fight with our COVID stigma. And those stigmas are the racial stigma, the blaming a particular community for the current situation, the violence against the health workers, which is right now going down, but still it's there. And the affected individuals are facing so much of social stigma. All these things, all of the participants, I 
I request all of you to fight it, to make the people aware of this fact. Be being kind to the affected individuals. Depend on facts and not on rumors. Spread awareness regarding do's and don'ts as endorsed by our health workers and providing the mental health care. So these are very important for all of us to do. And so I said request, stay at home. It has never been easier to save lives. So stay home, save lives. And that is going to, and along with that, prevention is better than cure, which has been told by Rabindranath Tagore in his Chokerbali long, long time back in his Bihari Charitra, that better to go not to the doctor, but try to do how not to go to the doctor. So use hand sanitizer, wear face mask, and help us stay safe, stay home, stop coronavirus, stay positive, which is also very, very important. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I am requesting the participants, if you have any question, queries, you can directly ask to sir. Sir is here. So put your microphone on and you can ask the question. So one question I could see, is it possible that COVID-19 naturally mutates to a much lesser pathogenic form, ultimately eliminating its deadly effects on human body? Yes, already there are certain forms are being identified which are less infections and which are less virulent also. But one particular thing I just want to share with my all my friends over here that other RNA viruses, they don't have any um, error corrective activities but this particular virus has got a three prime five prime exoribonucleus and their long term rate of nucleotide substitution fall within which the distribution and the lower mutation rate for this virus is there so it mutation rate is much higher but it is compensated by the high rates of virus replication within the hosts so the mutation but uh, good thing is that at the very beginning we have seen more infectious virus are coming right now it started that less infectious virus are coming and you know philosophically i was find that for the virus itself to survive for a long it has to keep its host uh, uh, not to go away actually death of the host they want to keep the host so that's why it will try to mutate to a less infectious form the other question uh, so I how has the addiction to other major illness like cancer yeah. been affected been affected yeah so here i shall request all my friends so uh, shuprutin if you look at that the map con is the jack stud pathway all these things are also factored in the cancer related and all many other disease related and all this cell signaling how it's being affected by this particular covid 19 infection so that itself will give us an idea about the relationship between the two that there will be always a relationship between the major illness which are also going to be affected as because of the phosphogenome changes Okay. Is there any question? Any queries? So I think there is no questions and people are tired of having three uh, lectures one after another. Uh, but I try to actually give you some information which is exci uh, excites me Sir, also, it is always fascinating to hear from you from these things on this particular thing. So anyone, there is no question, sir. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for everything. OK. Thanks to the organizers. Thanks to the people who are listening. So we are concluding this session.
so we are concluding this session and we will meet again at the evening session right at 7 right at 7 okay